there will now be an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Honorable members, before we start, uh, I'd like to invite members to join me in welcoming the young people in the gallery who are visitors to our public education unit as part of their June month activities and the rest of the visitors in the gallery. Welcome. The first item on the order paper is a motion in the name of the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Uh, th thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, we move that uh, this House extends the deadline by which the other committee on the review of the Powers and Privileges Act has to complete its task to the 30th of November 2017. So I put the motion. No objections agreed to. Honorable members, before I proceed, let me also uh, acknowledge in, uh, the presence in the gallery of the first deaf president of the Gallaudet University, Washington, D.C., and her spouse, Mary Bearmore. You are welcome to our parliament. The secretary will read the first order. Consideration of protected disclosures amendment bill and report of patrol committee on justice and correctional services on amendments proposed by the, by the National Council of Provinces. Honorable Pilani Majake. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Members of the House, members of the executive, members of the public, uh, good afternoon. The protected disclosure bill was duly adopted by the House and referred to the National Council of Provinces that amended section nine of the bill to make it inclusive. Um, the committee deliberated on the amendment and have accepted the amendment uh, with the DA and the ACDP indicating that they do support the amendment, even if they didn't actually support the bill. The report to be considered. Thank you. Um, as there are no list of speakers, I recognize the chief whip. Uh, yes, David Speaker, I move that the bill has amended be passed. Are there any objections? objections, uh, Deputy Speaker, and the DA requests a declaration. Thank you. All right. Let's give an opportunity for declarations. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, this bill emanates from the South African Law Reform Commission's report on protected disclosures, uh -huh. and the bill aims to extend the application of the Protected Disclosures Act beyond the traditional employer-employee relationship. Amend the principal act in order to regulate joint liability, introduce a duty to inform employees or workers who have made disclosures and to provide for immunity against civil or criminal liability in certain circumstances, and creates an offence in the case of false disclosure. Three public interest organisations made representations with regard to this piece of legislation, and the main thrust of their representations was that the criminalisation of false disclosures will have a chilling effect on whistleblowing for fear of prosecution. Honourable members, you will recall that when this bill was debated in this House, the Democratic Alliance pointed out that specifically the provision that a person who intentionally discloses false information and who ought reasonably to have known that the information is false be guilty of an offence and liable upon conviction to a fine or imprisonment for a period of up to two years or both. And this will have a deterring effect on potential whistleblowers. Our argument remains that the phrase ought reasonably to have known places an unduly a duty or potential on potential whistleblowers to verify to appoint the veracity of the information in question. The evaluation of whether a person reasonably ought to have known, while supposed to, is, while supposed to be an objective exercise, 
lends itself to different interpretations and even possibly abuse. The fact that the criminalization clause requires an intentional disclosure and the intent to cause harm to the affected party does not mitigate the potential for abuse, as it can be argued that even a valid disclosure will usually carry some intention, quite validly, to cause harm to the affected party. Measured against the ethos of the Bill of Rights, specifically the Equality Clause, as well as the constitutional duty placed upon the legislature to ensure that legislation passed by this House should enhance rather than hamper just administra administrative action and promote an efficient administration, then this bill does not meet these standards. If this bill is passed again by this House today, the Democratic Alliance will consider petitioning the President, that's President Zuma, not Gupta, to not sign the bill into law in its current form. For as long as the criminalization clause remains in this piece of flawed legislation, the Democratic Alliance cannot support it. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. When we presented our views for the second reading debate of this bill last year, we were empathic in our rejection of it on the basis that it did not offer comprehensive protection for those who are as disgusted as us by the corruption promoted by the Zuma Gupta Alliance in this country. We indicated then that its definition of occupational detriment, the bill sought to protect employees against being subjected to any civil claim for the alleged Point breach of, order, Chairperson. of a duty of confidentiality. Yes. Sorry, Honourable Speaker. Member, please take Can you please seat, ask please? the GA members if they leave to leave quietly? Because there's, there's a speaker at the podium. I, the, the all, all members must settle down and listen to the debate. That's what I'm ruling on here. Please order, Honourable Members. Order. Order, Honourable Members. Order. Go ahead, Honourable Member. We indicated then that its definition of occupational detriment, the bill sought to protect employees against being subjected to any civil claim for the alleged breach of a duty of confidentiality or a confidentiality agreement arising out of the disclosure of a criminal offense. The current amendment adds that employees are also protected when disclosing information which shows contraventions or failure to comply with the law or, or the presence of a possibility of such failure happening in the future. This is part of what we asked for in the bill to offer watertight protection of whistleblowers. But still, it is not comprehensive enough. As we argued before, the bill protects employees against civil claims for each of contracts or duties of confidentiality. This is our view. This, in our view, is not adequate protection for employees. It leaves them to open or to criminal legislation litigation by companies or those implicated in corruption. Lastly, the bill itself is defeating in that it explicitly offers no protection to employees who make claims or corruption that may later be proven to be untrue. This lack of protection for such matters will prevent many employees from airing their suspicion for corruption because should those be later proven to be untrue, employees will be left vulnerable. This defeats the whole purpose of the bill. It will prevent people, some that were indicated in the emails of the Sunday time, from disclosing this massive corruption because they know he used, they, they use the state funds to access the best lawyers to defend this corruption. For these reasons, the EFF does not support. Thank you. Honorable member, IFP. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker. The Protected Disclosure Amendment Bill stems from the NDP's recommendation that the Protect, uh, Protected Disclosures Act of 2000 be reviewed with the objective of strengthening support for whistleblowers. 
This was owing to the finding by the NDP that the said act does not afford the Wilson blower sufficient protection. The IFP concurs with the NDP in its assertion that the protection of whistleblowers is key to a strong and resilient anti-corruption system. In fact, the decline in the number of members of society who are prepared to come forward as whistleblowers can be ascribed to this lack of sufficient protection. This is unfortunate because our law enforcement agencies rely to a large measure on the assistance of the public in a successful apprehension and protection, uh, prosecution of perpetrators of corrupt cases, including fraud, bribery, theft of public funds, etc. Indeed, the bill does strengthen the protection of whistleblowers by extending the ambit of the said act beyond the traditional employer-employee relationship. It also grants the whistleblower immunity from criminal and civil liability. It goes further and makes it an offense to knowingly or intentionally make a false disclosure. Although the portfolio committee are welcome to the amendments, members were not unanimous regarding the inclusion of the clause that criminalizes intentional false disclosure. They feel that this will have a chilling effect on potential whistleblowers. The IFP, however, goes along with those parties, especially the ANC, who argue that the impact of a false disclosure is so serious on the innocent victim that a whistleblower who is guilty of the false disclosure should not go unpunished. The IFP supports this report. I thank you. Honorable Mwabe, NFP. Uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Members, guests in the gallery. South Africa has got 45 points out of 100 by Transparent International, which ranks countries according to the perceived level of corruption through surveys and assessment. This is four points up from a record low of 41% in 2011 and suggests that South Africa is perceived to be a generally corrupt country. The NFP welcomes any measures that will contribute towards rooting out corruption in South Africa. One such measure to root out corruption is the Protected Disclosures Amendment Bill. The bill creates additional safeguards for employees who make a protected disclosure, more commonly known as uh, whistleblowers, and also contributes to an environment in which whistleblowers may freely disclose information that exposes corruption in the workplace. The amendment proposed by the Portfolio Committee fortifies the environment by fine-tuning and expanding on the definition of occupational detriment to employees who make a protected disclosure. The NFP welcomes this proposed amendment. Occupational detriment is a real threat and a hindrance to the freedom to make a protected disclosure. And our current legislation does not provide sufficient protection in this regard. Very often, whistleblowers are victimized after a protected disclosure. And the threat of pending civil elections has thus far escaped the scope of legislative protection. By adopting this amendment proposed today, we will take one more small step closer to drawing a legislative net around corruption in South Africa. The NFP supports this report. Thank you. AIC, Honorable Naya. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. The history of the victimization of whistleblowers and the politicization of criminal justice have by and large energized our collective effort to creating the new normal in the new democratic dispensation. The Protected Disclosure Amendment Bill introduced in 2015 was thus long overdue. 
It replaces a cancellation of apartheid, black and vague, and narrow provisions in the bill's principal act of 2000. The apartheid style, if you think of the terminology employed to catalog the protection of independent contractors, consultants, and agents. The bill has widened the scope of the original definition of employees to a, a person who works or worked for another person or for the state, or B, any other person who in the manner sits or assisted in carrying on or conducting or conducted the business of any employer or client as an independent contractor or consultant or agent. C, any person who renders services to a client while being employed by a temporal employment service. The extension of the production of disclosure to independent contractors, consultants, and agents in the bill implicitly confers to these marginalized workers who, that any other law after the 1994 was unable to, they are inherited dignity. The original conception in 2000 Act to exclude independent contractors from the scheme of protected disclosures was inherited, flawed, and ill-equipped. The protection of the disclosure of information does not, however, extend to the disclosure of false information. This would, in the strict sense of the word, not protect information peddlers who furnish incorrect disclosures. The AAC supports the adoption of the bill. I thank you. ANC. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers present, members and fellow South Africans. I should say this at the outset that the bill before us it's a bill that was brought before Parliament before. And Parliament has dealt with this bill in its entirety. After the, the, the bill was read for the second time it was, and was sent to the NCOP, it was then that the NCOP re requested that as a further protection, we should insert a, one sentence in the bill which says that anything that we do about this protected disclosure must be subject to any civil claim for, for the alleged breach and the duty of confidentiality and or confidentiality agreement arising out of this disclosure must be a criminal offense. What is important about this bill is that it seeks to protect not only in the employ of the, of the state but in the employ of the private sector, people who have information that may be used to or against the employers who by any means do some of the things that are unscrupulous, we seek to protect all those people who must give us the information and give the inform information to the state. Now, I think it is disingenuous of the DA to leave. Their voters must see that um, when we must do serious legislation in the interest of the people, they just leave the house and they go to the bar. The EFF is also the same. The people must see. The only time we see their leader on a point of order, Chairperson. Yes, one, yes, Honourable Member, please take your seat, Honourable Member, Honourable Bongo, take your seat. Yes, Honourable Member. Would you ask the Honourable Member at the podium whether he would take a question about what is just? Yeah, said? Honourable Member, wait for him to take. Honourable Bongo, would you like to take a question? How would I take a question when they are all not here? I can't Honourable take a question. Honourable member, the question is no. Honourable Olis. can sit Just, down. Yeah. You know, I don't know what the uh, chairperson the EFF has turned these days. They don't come to the house. Every time you see their leader, they, are, they, are, they have turned to a mamko bozi party. All leaks are known by them. Everything that is going wrong in the country is just known by them, and they just go to the media. We are here, we must pass serious legislation that protects People who have issues of corruption that they must bring to the state. They are also in the bar with the alliance, the DA. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy Speaker, as the African National Congress, we support that we need to protect people who, in the employ of the state and any private sector, bring information that must assist us. Similarly, 
with anyone else in the country who has any information about anything. He must be able to bring it to books in a manner that is just and is legal. That's what we would like to say, Honorable Chair. We support. Thank you very much. Honorable Chief Whip, what are you rising on, sir? Honorable Deputy Speaker, I'm rising on Rule 98, requesting that the quest, the decision on the question, on this question, be postponed to a later date. Thank you. Honorable members, any any objection to that proposal? Deputy Speaker. Yes. May we ask why? Is it because the ANC members aren't here? Honorable, honorable member. A party with 249 member. MPs honorable can't even pass their own legislation. There being no objections, it is agreed to. The question is thereby postponed. The secretary. Is it possible that you can call members of the DA who are blocking traffic outside to come inside the house? No, no, honorable member, that's not a point of order. Chair, the secretary, of order. honorable member. Deputy Speaker, a point of order. Can we get someone at the slow lounge at the airport to ask the member, members to come back? Honorable member, that's not a point of order. <laughs> secretary will read the third order. <clears throat> Consideration of financial sector regulation bill and report of the committee on finance on amendments proposed by National Council of Provinces. Honorable Mtetwa. I'm still Mtembo, Honorable Deputy Speaker. In my notes, it's written uh, Mtetwa. I don't know why they, I'm misguided here. I'm sorry about it. Go ahead, Honorable Member. My, my apologies, Deputy Speaker. I move in terms of Rule 3093 that the bill as amended by the National Council of Provinces and the report thereon be referred back to the Standing Committee on Finance for reconsideration and further report. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Honorable members, are there any objections to that? No objections agreed to. The Secretary will read the fourth order. The secretary will read the third order. It should be the third order. I, yeah, go ahead. Consideration of request for permission in terms of rule 284 for 86 4C to inquire into amending other provisions of traditional leadership and governance framework act 2003, act number 41 of 2003. My notes uh, gives me a different name. Is that you, sir? Okay, go ahead, honorable. Yeah, yeah. Honorable members. No, I know honorable Masondo. What I have in my notes is honorable Mtet, and I don't see him here. So you, uh, uh, Chief, we please uh, send me appropriate names next time. All right, honorable Masondo, please proceed. No, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Honorable members esteemed visitors of the gallery. It is my privilege to stand here on behalf of the Cocta Portfolio Committee to indicate to you that the committee has been seized with the task of considering, considering and discussing the traditional leadership and governance framework bill, the BH 2017. This bill seeks to amend the provisions of the, of, of the traditional leadership and governance framework act 2003 Act number 41 of 2003, the principal act. Having realized that this work may require the committee to get the permission of this house in compli compliance with the NA rule 2863B, we hereby urge you to support this worthy endeavor and proposal. Thank you very much. Are there any objections to the committee being granted permission in terms of rule 2864C to inquire into amending other provisions of the traditional leadership and governance framework? No. De Deputy Speaker, we don't have an objection, but we would like to make a declaration, please. Thank okay, you. go ahead. Chairperson, let's make no bones about this. We're only having this discussion 
because the National House of Traditional Leaders, which had been part of the process on the, um, part of the legislative process on the Traditional Leadership and Governance Framework Amendment Bill from the very start, arrived at the last minute while the Portfolio Committee was going through the draft bill clause by clause with further amendments that made substantial changes to areas of the legislation that had not initially been under review. Now, it should be noted that other stakeholders made submissions to the committee within the prescribed time frame, and they presented their concerns. And the National House of Traditional Leaders was present for this, but they made no submissions of their own. Their proposed amendments have not been subject to public participation and input, and will be considered by the committee in isolation potentially opening this legislation up to constitutional challenge. While the DA supports the motion on this matter, if we are truly the people's parliament, it is important that the public participation process be reopened before this bill is tabled in the House. This is in line with section 59.1a of the Constitution, which requires that the National Assembly must facilitate public involvement in the legislative process, and has been supported by the recent, the recent constitutional court judgment in the land access movement of South Africa and others versus chairperson of the NCOP and others, where the court held that, and I quote, South Africa's democracy contains both representative and participatory elements. These elements are not mutually exclu exclusive. Rather, they support and buttress one another. The court has not rejected the argument that the public, sorry, the court has rejected the argument that the public need not participate in the legislative processes as its elected representatives are speaking on the public's behalf." End quote. In the new clicks judgment, Judge Sachs wrote, what matters, that, what matters is that at the end of the day, a reasonable opportunity is offered to members of the public and all interested parties to know about the issues and have an adequate say. And in a concurring judgment in Doctors for Life, he took the view that public involvement is of particular significance for members of groups that have been victims of processes of historical silencing. Nowhere could this be more true than in the case of traditional communities and those that represent them. The DA supports this motion on the proviso that meaningful public participation is permitted and that those who have commented earlier be permitted an opportunity to respond to the proposals of the National House of Traditional Leaders before the bill is co considered by the committee for adoption. Thank you. IFP. Thank you, Dr. Speaker. Alenjo Nguti, Lunga Shon Pirel Suala, Kufanele Sikfundo, Wa Mugera, Nguti, Iin Tlaga, Zine Enjela Lazo Ksebenz. Mako Kubambele Lega Gwazo, Agu Usho Kuti Kufanele Lagbe Nung Sindo Nga Loko. Bonke, Abante Ma Begele, Ituba, Thank you, Deputy uh, 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 Speaker. Uh, the, the recognition of traditional uh, uh, communities, the establishment and recognition of traditional councils, and the provision of a, a, a pragmatic statutory uh, framework within which traditional leaders can operate are the objects of and, and principles of the traditional leadership and governance framework act. However, we still find the, the non-alignment of uh, terms of office of regional uh, leadership structures and provincial legislation which provides for the relationship between kings and queens and provincial houses, pr problematic. Firstly, because the king's councils and kings and queens councils are still excluded. And then there is also the fact that uh, no provision is yet made for funding of these uh, structures. Then there is the issue of other provincial houses that fail to honor and establish the leg legislation timelessly to align their councils, yet has taken a, a long time, but for these structures, it is necessary. The institution of traditional leadership in South Africa has a definite role to play in our country and its future. This was confirmed by the Deputy President at recent held in Dava on the institution. Traditional council leadership, I mean, though, still remains the only structure uh, that does not uh, have clearly defined roles and functions in the Constitution, which is Chapter 12 of the Constitution. That talk, it only talks about uh, recognition only. In, in, in our democratic uh, South Africa, there is no reason why traditional leadership cannot co coexist uh, with democratic governance under the rule uh, of law. 
the ICA support the move. Thank you. Honorable Kubis, NFP. Section 211, Section 2.1.12. Eh, chapter 9, we feel more should be done with it. Now, the National Freedom Party believes that empowering our traditional leaders will assist in achieving one of the major objectives of the Act, namely to restore the integrity and the legitimacy of the institution of traditional leadership in line with the customary law and practices. Uh, Deputy Speaker, we have always maintained traditional leadership has a crucial role to play in governance of our people, particularly so in rural areas. It is to traditional leadership that our people turn to in times of strife for comfort and reassurance. It is, it is in traditional leadership which we vest the power to serve as custodians of our cultural and historical values. Moreover, traditional leadership represent continuity with our past and it helps us reclaim our identity as Africans and represents a focal rally point for expression of our cultural diversity and aspirations. The National Freedom Party would like to see that our traditional leaders be given more direct powers of governance at municipal and district level. If we were to give serious effect to Section 31 of our Constitution, which guarantees everyone the right, their cultural, religious, and linguistic communities, then traditional leadership should play a far more prominent role in local government than what is currently provided. We believe that our traditional leaders need to be assisted financially to go out about their way of representing the interest of the people living in their jurisdiction and to be the conduit for meaningful rural development. It is through traditional leaders that people will be able to formulate their voice in matters that concern them and their communities freely and sufficient resources must be made available to facilitate such opportunities. Uh, we support this report, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other declaration? No objections? Uh, are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The Secretary will read the fourth order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Training Industry on 7th International Meeting for Parliamentary Parliamentarians as part of 60, 67th in the National Astronautical Congress held in Guadalajara, Mexico. Honorable Fox. Thank you, Honorable Deputy uh, Speaker. Indeed, this is the report of the Portfolio Committee of Trade and Industry, but working jointly with the Portfolio Committee on Science and Technology, a back-to-back -back approach. We visited Mexico, we attended the Congress at the end of September 2016. Now space is not that remote. As children, we thought of the stars there, etc., and the moon, we even had nursery rhymes, but the reality is, the reality is, we are part, as planet Earth, of this universe. And as we are considering as planet Earth in inhabiting Mars, it becomes even more important to develop sound policies, principles on good governance. Now, trade and industry deals with one act, and this is the beauty of our country, balancing everything. So on the one side, trade and industry deals with the regulatory side, the governance side, and science and technology, as these great thinkers and innovators look towards the technology, the research and development. A great idea, a different set of a mandate and minister for the governance and another set. And if Japan had followed this route, we may not have had that catastrophe there. So 
We are also fortunate. South Africa has never said, winner takes all. We want to share. So we, although we did bid and we wanted SCAR, etc., we were happy, happy to be announced as South Africa as one of the partners. And really, I must congratulate you, uh, Minister Naledi Panda from Science and Technology. And I know the economic cluster here, represented by uh, Minister Patel, is also here, where we have SALT the Southern African Large Telescope. Most of us know it as, as it were, the Meerkat or SALT, and then we have the Square Kilometre Array, SCAR. And it's, a, it's not a very good abbreviation because of its connotations, but SCAR is the way forward. Go and visit there and go and occupy all those B&Bs and grow it up. So the thing is that, you know, you go there, all the others, they are Dr. S, Professor Y, and so on and so forth, and you feel quite small until you are told, as parliamentarians, you are the voice of your people, and therefore, we need you to tell us as scientists no, I've just explained I'm not, but you're not listening. <laughs> no. That how do we govern? Because the most important thing is people. People. How do we serve our people? And science must be made to serve our people. And it can. It can. It can help us to develop policy, to develop planning, and most of all, to implement. Now, we now have in this international fraternity, Unispace 50, and that emphasizes the four thematic pillars, space economy, space society, space accessibility, and believe it or not, space diplomacy. I think I should start applying now to be a diplomat on Mars. I may get that one. But the most important thing, and you know, Honourable Deputy Speaker, I am so glad that I was delayed until now to present this report, because this is Youth Month. And one of the big recommendations is that in terms of capacity building up there, the young people who are our future, they have told us, please involve youth, not you, ma'am, youth, in the space explanations. So we are going to do just that. And so I commend this report to you as we reach for the stars, Mars to inhabit and help build a better life on planet Earth, South Africa. Thank I you. Thank you. Honourable. I now recognize the Honorable Chief Whip. The Deputy Speaker, I move that the report be accepted and adopted by this House. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? Deputy Speaker, no objections, but we would like to make a declaration, please. Okay, Thank go you. ahead. Declaration. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, good afternoon to all of our young guests in the gallery. Certainly the uh, Honourable Fubs, every time she comes up here, is one of the more lively and energetic members that we have in the House, and I think that every year she continues to qualify for Youth Month, so good to see her still here with us. Ladies and gentlemen, space exploration provides us with an opportunity for increased investment and job creation in South Africa, something we desperately need in times of recession that we're currently in. However, for such investment and job creation to take place, we need to ensure that we have an enabling environment that allows for multinational companies to invest in our budding scientists and entrepreneurs 
to continue with their research and development as we reach for the stars. Space is certainly a place that South Africa can play a greater part in, where our voice can be heard more loudly on the international space, uh, space stage. However, we also need to recognize the great technological advances that we stand to benefit through this, especially when it comes to predicting natural disasters, and we've just seen one horrific one in Neisner, and if one looks at international trends, specifically in the United States and Australia, they are using space technology to predict such wildfires and the spread of them, and hopefully in the future, we can use such technology to mitigate these types of disasters. But in order to take full uh, uh, appreciation of these technologies, we need to ensure that there's greater t uh, um, cooperation between science and technology minister and between our department in trade and industry. Mars is the next frontier. Uh, we need to be prepared to forge ahead into this new period of space exploration um, and development. And the Democratic Alliance will support the report. Thank you. Okay. Um, before you, honorable member, uh, honorable members, please join me also to welcome a parliamentary commission from Uganda led by Honorable Cecilia Atim Gwal, visiting us in South Africa. <laughs> welcome, welcome to South Africa and Parliament. Uh, please go ahead, Honorable Member. EFF. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. While we as the EFF do not object to the adoption of the report of the Portfolio Committee, on trade and industry on the seventh international meeting for the parliamentarians as part of the 67th International Astronautical Congress in Mexico. It is necessary for lawmakers to continue to be part and parcel of spaces that are dedicated to, to information, new research, and innovation. As the report clearly demonstrates, the space is becoming more and more important and integral part of the global economy. And it is also clear that the element of sustainability and affordability of exploration that is not only environmentally friendly, but it takes into account the broader needs of society. South Africa must continue to participate in programs of space exploration. We must be part of creation and discovery of innovation. However, the history of space exploration has demonstrated that prioritization of economic benefits for few multinational corporations over so societal programs. And it is, and, it, and at times with program, programs that are full of discre discre discrepancies and loss of billions. It is therefore important that there is a clear consideration of limited resources. Our involvement in space exploration must benefit humanity. And in future, these groups must include other parties. If we are increasing the delegation, it must not mean we are increasing the number of the people from the ANC. Other parties must get opportunities. Tomorrow, we will have to decide on these policies and laws when we are in power. I thank you. Honorable S. Tyson, IFP. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The conference aim was to show emerging countries like South Africa the benefits of becoming more involved after this program was being dominated for years by the US and Russia. The challenge of space exploration has sparked new scientific and technical knowledge and inherent value to humankind. Computers became exponentially better in understanding the world. Software will disrupt most traditional industries in the near future. The Goddard Space Flight Center listed 2,271 satellites in orbit during the duration of the Astronautical Congress. We witnessed one purposely being destroyed on screen. Russia has the most satellites currently in orbit with 1,324 satellites. United States follow with 658. This is the only spacecraft, this is only spacecraft and not a 5,500 thousand tweezers of smaller orbital debris that circles Earth. 
22,000 of these are big enough for officials on the ground to track. And even the smaller pieces of space junk float in the Earth's orbit at speeds exceeding 35,000 kilometers an hour. That's more, roughly eight, kil uh, eight kilometers a second. Several solutions to retrieve or moving the space junks have been put forward by the Braunschweig University of Space Technology, but also unsuccessful. Changes in the rotation of the Earth's core can be detected by the changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And in his presentation, Prof. Dunbury said, the Earth's core has accelerators. His theory was that huge glaciers, such as Argentina's Benito Moreno, that contained huge amount of mass near the poles, uh, close to the Earth's axis of rotation, is melting. When glaciers melt, the melt water end up in the oceans, moving the weight away from the axles and accelerating the Earth's rotation. Our solar system is just over 4.5 billion years old. And the sun that's burning hydrogen into helium is running out of hydrogen to burn and is already noticeable brighter. It's estimated by scientists that after about a billion years from now, the sun will become hot enough to boil our oceans. To a great extent, the benefits from space exploration are rooted in the generation of new knowledge, which is the first reward and which has been inherent value to humankind. Space technology has helped us understand how Earth works and how we can keep it healthy. Space is already becoming the link among systems of systems and its enabling function may therefore represent the new element that will help to bring our society towards a goal of the sustainable living on the planet for all. Thank you. Thank you. NFT. Thank you. As space and, and space exploration is undeniable a new frontier where man and science and technology meet. Hence, it is fitting that our parliament should be represented by portfolio committees on trade and industry, science and technology and other relevant portfolios. The benefits for South Africa and our people of actively participating in this frontier could, immense, could be immense at many levels. For instance, economic, social, and political. And the responsibility rests with our representatives and role players in this field to ensure that we get maximum benefit. The National Freedom Party understands and accepts that humanity's journey into space is a reality. And we welcome the fact that there is now full recognition that the benefits of this journey to humanity should be motivation for further technological developments and explorations into space. And yes, we know that there is unanimous agreement among countries that there is a need for development of stronger space governance fr uh, frameworks and mechanisms, which we welcome. We do, however, wish to pause and ask these questions. What ethical guidelines are in place to ensure that this journey is not one of exploration, exploitation? What mechanism will be in place to ensure compliance? And more importantly, what institutional enforcement object, uh, options will be available to ensure that all humanity share equally and equitable in this journey? We trust that our representative to future international meetings for parliamentarians will vigorously canvas these issues and ensure that our participation does not transgress the values which we stand for and serves to espouse our voice at the same time. On a reflective concluding note, Chairperson, discussing this report here today reveals a bitter irony in the state of affairs in South Africa. On the one hand, we are participating as a country at the cutting edge of technology and science, taking a proud place in a global environment geared up to expand our technology and human capital into space. Yet, at the same time, many of our people do not ha have access to basic human dignities, such as clean and safe drinking water, decent sanitation, and secure, and secure homes. The National Freedom Party, we say it is good to keep an eye on the future, but at the same time, we should not neglect to address the challenges of the present. Uh, Deputy Speaker, we support this report. Honourable Deputy Speaker, 
Dit is vir my een aangename voorig as een lid van die ANC, maar as ook een woon, inwoner van die Noordkaap, om te sien dat vooruitgang bij jou plaas vind. En hier is een baie groot geleentheid vir inwoners van die Noordkaap, en specifiek die area van die SKA, om te sien dat jong mense bemachtig word, want ons sien al reeds veranderinge en uitdagings wat aangespreek word, en dit is typisch van die ANC regering, dat hulle vir hulle beuiver nog altyd om die jong mense, maar ook die inwoners van achtergeblewe gemeenskappe te verander, omstandighede te verander, en deurbemachtiging, en dit is waarom het so belangrik is om te sê, ons is trots op die ANC geleide regering, en ons ver, uh, daarom sien ons uit daarna, om en daarom ondersteun ons te dankie. Dankie. Honorable members, the motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The secretary will read the fifth order. Debate on Youth Day, Advancing Youth Economic Empowerment. Uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister of Education and Training. <laughs> Deputy Speaker, Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, Young People in the Gallery, Fellow South Africans. Honorable Deputy Speaker, I rise to open this important debate on Youth Day during this year of Oliver Tambo, and when we honor the 1976 Matthias, who 41 years ago led a milestone student protest against a decree issued by the then Education Department that Afrikaans was to become a language of instruction in all our schools. The rioting soon spread from Soweto to other townships in the Vedbaders Rand, <coughs> Pretoria, Deben, and Cape Town, and developed into the largest outbreak of violence that South Africa has ever experienced. These were noble and dedicated students who showed reckless disregard for their own safety and in emulating their forebears, they courageously rejected the Bantu education system, demanding quality education for all, which was in turn going to allow our youth to claim their rightful place in history. Former President Oliver Tambo, a towering intellectual and mathematics teacher who converted to become, to become a lawyer, showing his outstanding intellectual abilities, concluded and said, and I quote, there is no vocabulary to describe the nobility and the pathos of the conscious sacrifices that the black youth of South Africa have made to free themselves, their people in the country from forces determined to keep us forever the chattens." Close quote. Honorable Chairperson, 41 years later, and as we celebrate the great strides we have made to defeat the tyrant of apartheid and its skewed policies that favor the white minority, we have got to consolidate the gains of freedom as young people of South Africa, for history has now imposed on us to occupy the forward trenches in the final assault on poverty, unemployment, and ignorance. We should be able to identify the gap for development and actively pursue the objectives that seek to uplift our people and renew our society. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the 1994 democratic breakthrough so as embarking on a process of rewriting history, we had to re-engineer our education system, and I am happy to report that while there are still outstanding issues of transformation and ensuring that access is followed by success, but we now have legislative and policy frameworks in place which guide us on our new trajectory and which we use as an expression of the future we aspire, particularly for our postal system. Fellow South, African, for South Africans, education remains an indispensable device of social transformation. It has the propensity to enhance the employability of our youth and assist them in reading from themselves the bondage of poverty and underdevelopment. We believe that skilling our labor, our labor force will play a role in fighting unemployment directly by providing skilled people to a skilled staffed economy, but also indirectly by providing a stimulus to economic uh, growth 
and the development of new and existing industries and economic sectors. We are also aware that this is a ticking time bomb that such a big number of young and energetic population of our societies out of school and out of jobs yet we continue to import skills. This is the reason why our government took an informed decision to make education, job creation, and decent work its number one priority for the current period. And in this, and in this regard, would like to highlight the fact that education and training are indeed a critical component of achieving growth and development of the various priority economic sectors. Honorable members, over the past decade, we have been highly engaged in the process of restructuring our CETAs and positioning them ideally to facilitate sector-specific training initiatives with both the private and public sectors. I can report that contrary to popular belief that these are, are, are corrupt institutions, that they are now in contact with the overwhelming number of employers in the country, and we have invested sufficient resources for them to facilitate partnerships between our training institutions and employers. These partnerships will benefit the large number of youth or students of our country who will now be able to access both theoretical and practical knowledge. It is indeed concerning honorable members that we have, we have a number of both University of Technology and Tibet College students who cannot complete their studies and graduate because they do not possess the workplace learning component required to do so. This has compelled sitters to expedite their efforts to forge these linkages, and indeed, we are beginning to see results. Again, as part of addressing the above challenges as government, we have signed a skills accord together with labor, business, and community constituencies at NETLEC, and through this accord, we want to turn every workplace into a training space. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy Speaker, rather, I need to indicate that in our country, there is this wrong notion that post-school education only means university education. This is not the case, and we are trying very hard to dispel this notion, and in our quest to promote Tivet colleges or the Tivet college sector, we are hoping that our young people will find them equally attractive. As directed by the NDP, we want to reverse the anomaly of having more young people, of having more young people in our university system than in our Tivet system. Our view, is that at least by 2030, we should be having a ratio of three TVET students to one university uh, student. We see the TVET college sector as a viable option for young people because it is our strong belief that the courses offered at our vocational education and training centers are appropriate to build the critical skill space that our economy needs and in turn will make our young people more eligible for employment opportunities. We are putting systems in place to ensure that the output from these institutions are not for the sake of producing graduates, and hence we are progressively influencing the modification of the curriculum in order to proactively respond to the needs of the labor market. We continue to urge our young people to consider taking up careers along technical and, uh, and vocational skills, this within a context of a very serious shortage of mid-level personnel in the country. We certainly have to do more in prioritizing this area as people with these skills are able to fill the many jobs which are necessary to expand the economy and in turn help our young people achieve their own sustainable livelihoods. We have declared 2014 to 2024 as the decade of the artisan with the sole aim of creating a pipeline of qualified artisans who can play a crucial role in growing the emerging sectors of our economy. Our government is determined to change the deep-seated structural inequality that faces our youth, who constitute, by the way, the largest proportion of the South African populace. In our quest to sharpen the country's global competitive edge and industrial productive capacity, the white paper for post-school education and training system endeavors to train 30,000 artisans per annum by 2030 as directed by the National Development Plan. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the Department of Higher Education and Training has been leading in encouraging all spheres of government to increase their intake of internships, and we are confident that this trend will grow steadily. On the issue of access to higher education, we have been concerned, of course, about our, our, about our poor yet academically deserving students who are failing to access post-school education and training opportunities because they do not have the means to actually do so. 
The National Student Financial Aid Scheme has been doing a sterling job in this regard, but there is no doubt that the demand for funding has been too huge. To date, the scheme has benefited more than 2 million South Africans who have since joined, who have since joined the ranks of the black middle class. We have massively extended the reach of NASFAS since the genuine call of students for a no fee increment, but obviously, as I said, uh, as we increase the allocation, the demand also increases. But we will be making pronouncements uh, after the commission that was appointed by the president has concluded its work and its report uh, has been considered by government. I feel obliged, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Members, to digress and express my heartfelt condolences to the Minister of Higher Education and Training, Dr. Bladen Zemande and his family, for the loss of his mother, to whom we remain indebted for giving us such an industrious intellectual who I, have, who I have been assigned by the President to ably lead the Ministry and the Department with. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Wai Kasim, GA. Honorable Deputy Speaker, as has become typical of the ANC for a debate of this importance and as we commemorate the youth of 1976, ANC MPs and cabinet ministers just haven't seen it important enough to pitch up. The ANC has sold out my generation, particularly young black South Africans. There can be no doubt that the legacy of colonialism and apartheid continues to dictate our life stories. The circumstances of our birth still dictate our success, and these circumstances have a color to it. Why then do I blame the ANC? Is it perhaps because I'm a DA MP? Or maybe, maybe is it because despite 23 years into our democratic dispensation, and despite spending one-fifth of our budget on education, a black child in South Africa will receive an education that is considered amongst the very worst in the world. It is therefore no coincidence that the same child is still 100 times more likely to grow up in poverty than a white child. The reality is that if you had the misfortune of being a poor black child growing up in South Africa, you would most likely be one of the 50% of grade one pupils who will never live to write a metric examination. Most certainly, you will be one of the 80% of children who would receive an education that is considered amongst the very worst in the world an education that will consign you to a lifetime in poverty. And if through sheer grit and determination you manage to beat these odds and actually write and pass a matric examination, chances are that you would be part of the 75% of matriculants without a bachelor's pass. Without a decent education, any form of economic empowerment for black South Africans will remain elusive. I have no doubt that the ANC will continue to blame all of this on colonialism and apartheid. And they're right. They're quite right. But what South Africans have come to learn, that though and whilst colonialism and apartheid has placed young black South Africans in a state of economic disempowerment, it is the ANC government that has kept them there. This is not the ANC that we supported growing up. It is an ANC that has sold out an entire generation to the Guptas, to Satu, and to patronage politics. For those naive enough to, to believe, even amongst your own benches, that electing CR17 at your conference will somehow cause the ANC to self-correct, one must only listen to his brown nosing of Satu, calling them great and powerful in order to gain their political support. Honorable Selling out our children. Deputy Speaker. Order, order. Yes, Honorable Member. Honorable Kasim, please take your seat. Is the member ready to take a question to answer as to whether Honorable there's member, anything he can ever debate wait, outside the Gupta issue? Wait, let the Honorable Member indicate. I think South Africans have had enough of the Guptas and your president, quite frankly. I'm not willing to take your question. Can ever debate. Go ahead, and remember. Selling out our children is apparently a prerequisite to leading the ANC. No wonder there is something broken. Honorable Deputy Speaker, it's all about priorities and choices. Youth economic empowerment will forever remain an empty rhetoric 
if the ANC is entrusted with the choices that will define our generation. Time must surely be up. Young black South Africans face unemployment levels of over 60%. Over 3 million South Africans referred to as needs or not in education or employment or training. And over 9 million South Africans are unemployed. Our youth are suffocating and yet the ANC is too self-obsessed to realize it. Take the ANC mayor of Etequini as an example. Her answer to Youth Month is to spend ratepayers' money on a breakfast for babes who do more and nasty see. <laughs> now, I must admit that since I don't listen to music, I have no idea who these people are, although I have reason to believe that at least one of them is nasty and I'm referring to the ANC mayor. The point, though, <laughs> is that it shouldn't be about fancy shindigs or gaining popularity to win an ANC leadership battle. It should be about making the choices required to save an entire generation who have been set up to fail and never make it out of poverty. The DA is the only party that can make these choices. Th South Africans must choose a different government if we are to truly empower our youth. Since the DA became the government in the Western Cape, we have broken new ground and have both the highest retention rates and bachelor's pass rates in the country. The pass rate for the most disadvantaged schools in the province has been improved to 75%, having been 57% when the DA took over from the ANC in the Western Cape in 2006. A DA-led government in 2019 is surely the best hope for true empowerment of young black South Africans. Opening opportunities for young South Africans and preparing them for these opportunities will be our greatest focus. When leading government post-2019, we will ensure that young black South Africans have access to a truly quali to a, to quality basic education, which will empower learners to succeed. We will provide a free year of vocational training to all matriculants. We will offer free quality higher education and training to poor qualifying students up to a postgraduate level. We will invest heavily in internships and learnership opportunities, including a meaningful youth wage subsidy. We will invest in small businesses and support young people to build and employ others. We can do all this and more because as the Democratic Alliance, we are not beholden to the same forces which have captured, captured the ANC. A DA government would surely put young people first. Thank you very much. Honorable Mbata. Deputy Speaker, our young students and youth at the gallery, colleagues and friends, the best present for South Africans is to take the ANC out of power. Because just like in any circumstance, it is a liberation movement that has run out of its own cause. On the occasion of the 41th anniversary of June 16, we would like to salute the generation of 1976. This generation took everything it has, irrespective of the shortcomings of their time. They decided that they, as a generation, will define their own struggles informed by their own oppression. And in this, they excel in their own struggle. As a marxist leninist Fanonian movement, we draw our aspirations and our struggles to continue the cause of economic freedom in our lifetime from the June 16, 1976 movement. Our struggle for economic freedom to young people means the following. It means you will obtain education free from educare to high school and continue from high school to higher education up until first degree. That is the distance that we can go as a loving government. In paying tribute to these young lions of 1976, the gallant fighters of our time, we would like to thank them for a life well lived, a life well cherished for our nation to be born today. Hector Peterson and Zietze Machinini were gallant fighters that continued to lead the symbolism of this great struggle. 
They fought against Africans as a medium of instruction. But that was not the only struggle. It was a struggle to decolonize education as a whole. The struggle to put the best interest of black oppressed at the heart of the equation of what was fair and what was just. And this is the struggle that draw the international community and the armed struggle closer. While the ANC leaders were busy drinking beer in Lusaka and sipping whiskey in London, our young people fought apartheid forces in the street daily. Our young people continued the cry. They said freedom or death, victory is certain. We also wish to link the struggle of 1976 with a very unique struggle, the struggle of the United Democratic Front, the struggle of Kenik Mtagatinlov, Archie Kumed, Hector Peterson, and Tietze Machinini never met Archie Kumed, neither did they ever meet or and never met Kenik Mtagatinlov. But these two struggles, co-authored and co-created a journey and conditions that made our people both inside and outside the country, meaning those involved in the armed struggle and those involved in international isolation to have a fertile ground. Our youth today are fighting for economic freedom in our lifetime, not because it has to be a destination. It's a continued journey because until we have our land, freedom means nothing. We will continue to fight unemployment because Honorable it is skyrocketing member, under the ANC I'm rule. Afraid your time is we will expired. continue to fight inequalities because the ANC has no shame. Thank you very much. IFP, Honorable Mkuleko Lengwa. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Members, and the youth of South Africa in the gallery and at home. Let us salute the youth of 1976 and from their commitment to freedom and democracy and education, let us also then do what they did and continue that struggle to ensure that South Africa becomes a better place for all young South Africans. In 2017, the youth of South Africa are faced with high unemployment, 27%, stunted economic growth, junk status, a technical recession, poverty, inequality, social ills, and a lack of leadership. Yet we come here and speak about economic freedom. Honorable Deputy Speaker, since 2012 when I got to this parliament, I have raised the issue and shall continue doing so, that for so long as we do not have a dedicated and focused parliamentary committee to deal with youth matters, we are leaving the youth behind. There's a multi-party women's caucus, yet there's no formal structure of parliament to at the very least begin meditating on the issues of young people. Last year we had the issue of fees must fall and an ad hoc arrangement was made just for us to come and sit together. It materialized to nothing. But it begs the question, why is the multi-party youth caucus not receiving attention? Well, it is because out of 249 members of parliament of the ANC on the side of the house, only one of them is below the age of 35 out of 249. Honorable Deputy Speaker, fees have not fallen. Decolonized education remains unachieved. NSFAS remains complicated and corrupt and those who need it most do not get it. So, how did we get here? Well, <coughs> during the days of the struggle, the ANC said liberation now, education later. And thanks to the sanity of the IFP and principal tell as we said, education for liberation. If we can go back to those basics and focus on ensuring that we create the knowledge, skills, and expertise which our economy needs, and then for us to begin and identify scientific, technological, and innovative capabilities in, in our country, beneficiate around them, and create new economies, we'll be able to grow this education. Colleges of education must be reopened so that we've got quality teachers who can go back into our schools and give quality teaching. We are recycling 
ignorance. We've got teachers who are incapable to teach because the system is incapable of teaching them how to teach. And they go back into the classroom and actually meet out what it is that they are failing to do. Honorable Deputy Speaker, let us, let us address the land question for the sake of economic growth and economic development. But the bottom line is, honorable as I've member, said before, Honorable House Chairperson, the ANC has failed the people of South Africa, the ANC has failed the youth, and I gave you a red card before. Honorable I'm member, you your a red time card has again. expired. Pack your bags and go, you have failed the youth. The next speaker is Omar Ngwabe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Honoured members and guests, when our hard fought democracy came into being, paid for by the blood and sacrifices of the class of 1976, the youth had, had hoped that we were at the dawn of a new era. The youth had dreamed of the day when everybody would be equal, where dignity would be a cornerstone of our social fabric, and a bright future would be beckoned to all. Looking back, we can see that. We were somehow deceived, and we have to ask ourselves today, will we have the courage to see that we are still being deceived, or will we be quick to hope once more? Empowering our youth at an economic level is the key for a better future, a future of hope and a future of possibilities. If we are to address youth economic empowerment, we will have to address the burning issue of youth unemployment and skills development. Chairperson, our current youth unemployment rate is almost 48% and has worsened over the past eight years despite a great deal of policy attention and the implementation of a range of public and private interventions. From the submissions made today, it is clear that the challenge of youth unemployment in South Africa is a structural issue which will require massive policy investment, political will and time. It is fine that we invest in the long-term strategic goals, but the NFP believes that it is equally important to concentrate on what can be done in the interim, what can be done right now. Maybe Honorable Deputy Minister Manamela will have also to visit the issue of the curriculum in our teacher institutions. Is it fine that we keep on popping money on NSFAS, but the graduates are not what the labor market wants? Honorable Deputy Speaker, the NFP believes that if the issue of youth unemployment is not addressed as a matter of agency, the situation can be expected to increase the levels of frustration and impatience among our youth and will contribute to a cycle of chronic unemployment and poverty which has to be avoided at all costs. But whatever we do, let us not deceive our youth again with empty promises. Thank you. The next speaker is the Honorable Fultani. I'm a recycled youth. <laughs> Honorable Deputy Speaker, the 41st anniversary of the National Youth Day is marked against the reality of a country that is experiencing economic hardships with skyrocketing youth unemployment, chronic poverty, and deprivation. These challenges mean that government needs to increase investment on in human capital development. In addition to improving basic education, the training systems must be transformed so that young people can acquire relevant and quality skills that can help them master their lives and contribute to the socio-economic development of their country. For this to happen, it will, amongst other things, require the following. Increase investment in the training institutions, reorienting the curriculum to introduce practical entrepreneurial training, decentralizing training to local authorities, including local artisans at village level linking training institutions to the labor market for absorption. We also need to promote youth citizenship in an inclusive manner. The number of youth that is forced to go to the streets is on the rise as a result of poverty, lack of employment, and loss of hope. 
In this regard, there's a need to decriminalize socially orientated uh, street youth. They should be made to feel secure and should be facilitated to take advantage of emerging economic opportunities in the mainstream society. More efforts should be put in place to rehabilitate young offenders and drug addicts. This calls for a change in attitude and outlook among policymakers in respect of the activities and aspiration of young people, especially those in the streets. We need a strategy to assist young people to be entrepreneurs, and this strategy should include, but not be limited to, one, continuously improvement of the national youth policy 2020, continuously monitoring, evaluating, and improving youth access to credit, continuously and consistently uh, providing business development service for youth and improving the institutional and enterprise network. And um, given that not all young people can be entrepreneurs, the labor intensive based methods for infrastructure development will have to be seriously reconsidered. At the core of the issues that weigh against young people is corruption, especially among those who are charged with the important tasks of governance of ensuring that the dividends of democracy reach all our people, including youth, corruption must be rooted out together with its branches. Further, youth as an integral part of the South African society are equally facing a variety of other challenges, including residual social racism, tribalism, xenophobia, and other forms of uh, social pathologies choking off our vision of a free and just society. Honorable Chair, as these challenges affect our young people, Female youth are significantly worse off, and special priority needs to be applied to the social, cultural, and political recognition they deserve. Accordingly, youth must, working together as a social force and as an integral part of a broader society, take lead in the championing of their own development and dictate their own destiny. This work must be done, and it must be done now. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Madisha. The Youth Day in our country is linked to the uprising of a students on June 16, 1976 in Soweto and of course beyond Soweto uh, borders. We know that the uprising related to the introduction of Bantu education and the introduction of Africans as a medium of instruction uh, in schools. That, that was an attempt by the apartheid regime to ossify apartheid. We know that as a consequence of June 16, many students stopped going to school and join the liberation movement. We know that others simply stopped going to school, that as a consequence, they gained no skills and thus never had the opportunity of gainful employment. We know that this led to many attending to gangsterism, thuggery, criminality, and social decay. June 16 was the spark that ignited our liberation struggle. It was the youth that started our internal revolution. It's hard not to see parallels between June 16, 1976 and the challenges that face our youth today. More than 20 years into democracy, young people are still languishing in poverty and are plagued by crime, violence, unemployment, and lack of education. Today, our youth are subjected to failing state schooling. Our state schools condemn more than half of our school's youth to a future of unemployment and welfare dependency. Over half of our youth between 21 and 25 are not in education or employment. Six out of every 10 people younger than 25 are unable to find em any employment at all. Today, our jails are filled with youth, but not through their involvement in liberation struggles, but rather through hunger. The anger of the youth is more palpable than ever. 
we have witnessed their anger on our university campuses. But those at the university represent a small and somewhat elite portion of our youth. If the frustrations of the millions of young people in the townships who feel badly let down by this failing government erupt well, into action your time is now for the most expired. basic uh, human rights, such as water, sanitation, uh, etc., we have a problem. Well, remember, your and time has expired. The next speaker is the Honorable Dudley. Thank you, Chair. Today's youth are as awesome as any generation before, and it is their turn to create opportunities for future generations to build on. The ACDP would like to see Youth Month facilitating opportunities for the passion of young people to be ignited, and then for them to take practical steps to follow their dreams. On the subject of economic empowerment, the ACDP calls on the National Youth Development Agency, which has been allocated a budget of 430 million and business to commit to partnering to ensure relevant skills de uh, development, youth entrepreneurial opportunities, and other initiatives that can help young people gain relevant experience. Then there's the fourth industrial revolution on our doorstep with the World Economic Forum estimating that 60% of all children in primary school this year will be in jobs that don't exist today. This is, a trouble, is as troubling as it is exciting. If our young people are to be in these jobs, it will be crucial for them to study courses that will give them an opportunity to compete in the job market and for South Africans to compete globally in the job uh, globally to ensure a better future for everyone living in South Africa. And then there's the latest buzzword that has captured the imagination of young people far and wide, but even more so in South African universities, decolonization. And more specifically, decolonization of education. Now the vigorous interchange of ideas is both encouraging and somewhat concerning. The ACDP understands decolonization of education to mean that the nation must become independent with regards to the acquiring of knowledge, skills, values, beliefs, and customs. And this makes sense. What makes no sense are students' statements along the lines of, for decolonized education to be introduced, the existing system must be overthrown, and the people um, it's supposed to serve must define it for themselves. Now, the curricula of schools and tertiary institutions will be worth very little if they do not build on the best knowledge, skills, values, beliefs, and habits from around the world. These cannot be limited to one country nor one continent. Much of the excellent work done in South Africa's universities could, in fact, be undone if students push this philosophy. The vice president of the Academy of Science at the University of Pretoria puts it something like this. If we isolate ourselves, Knowledge-wise, South Africa's own amazing advances would be lost to the rest of the world. Our countries, other countries, are happy to benefit from our discoveries. We should continue to benefit from their discoveries too. Without a healthy balance, South Africa could find itself rejecting all the advances of modern education, science, and medicine that originate in other parts of the world. And this would include penicillin and HIV antiretroviral treatment drugs neither of which were developed in Africa. We cannot limit the knowledge base of South Africa's next generations to only regional knowledge and culture. We must, of course, be locally relevant and celebrate research and researchers in South Africa. The ACDP has confidence in today's youth. The next speaker is the Honorable Tseke. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson, uh, Honorable Ministers present, uh, Honorable Members of Parliament, the learners in the gallery, and the guests in the gallery, Dumelang. Allow me to join my progressive comrades in celebrating the lives of a fearless young people who paid the ultimate price of death for the heroic and revolutionary role uh, they played in objecting the discriminatory apartheid uh, education system. Who saw it befitting to fight for the rights and to fight for the liberation of our people. 
the struggle forged by Comrade Peter Mokaba, Tsetsi Machine and Solomon Machangu and Rumadi should not be lost in vain. But we must soldier on as young people in making sure that we radically transform the socio-economic empowerment of our young people in the dusty streets of Marapiani, of Tlachameng, of Matatiele, and the rest of the country. As we celebrate the centenary of our former, pres uh, former president, Oliver Reginald Tambo, we must take stock of where we come from, what are the legacies that they've left in the country, and how best can we shape our future for the, for the generations to come. The NC-led government is committed in moving this country forward, in making sure that young people, including young people with disabilities, receive job op opportunities. I must say, a uh, House Chairperson, that the legacy of more than 300 years of colonialism and slavery cannot and will never be erased in 23 years. That's a fact, Honorable Kasim. Let me also remind on honorable members that the youth of this country is not lost. As we celebrate this year, June 16, we must remember that the lost generation are the ones who stole our land. And today they claim that if we take, out, take back our land, there will be civil war. Nonetheless, we are not frightened nor threatened by white monopoly capitalists who forever wants to enrich themselves. Honorable Teke, will you just take your seat, please? Honorable Kasim. You can't take phone calls in the house. It's quite clear. And I'll ask the whips of the day to please address the member. Continue, honorable member. Honorable Chair, you may continue. Thank you very much. Um, on top of that uh, situation, lost generation, um, Chairperson, the lost generation are the ones who stole our land. And today they claim that if we take back our land, there will be civil or Nonetheless, you are not frightened or threatened by white monopoly capitals who forever wants to enrich themselves and has robbed our forefathers of their belong belongings. The NC as a leader of the society must continue radically so to represent the voice of the voiceless and implement the mandate that was given by the 62% of our voters in the 2014 uh, national elections. South Africa is a generation that must find its way more comfortably and productively in rapid changing country and world. By investing in a focused and a strategic way in this generation, we are guaranteeing a great and a bright future for our country. Oliver Tambo once said, a country, a movement, a person that does not value its youth and children does not deserve its future. As we declared 2017 a year of Oliver Tambo, we must continue to move our great country towards the vision of a united, a non-racial, and sexist, democratic, and a prosperous society. That's the strategic objective of the National Democratic Revolution. Chairperson, the path which our country has chosen is a complex and invites extreme commitment and dedication from us, uh, those assigned to lead. South Africa belongs to all its people, and the future of our country is a collective future. Doing good for youth is good for business. As we pay tribute to the 1976 youth, we acknowledge that the struggle was not in vain. Jack Arikul Tumaza Bashava 1976. is Chairperson, South Africa has made enormous strides in youth development over the years. Government has spent more than 710 million to support over 15,000 entrepreneurship, spent billions of rents uh, in leadership, internship, and scholarship programs. The Art and Culture Department has introduced the Mzanzi Golden Economy a Strategy and a number of high impact programs targeting youth and women in the arts has been identified. The EPWP program or initiatives that sees young people involved in the refurbishment, rehabilitation, and maintenance of community infrastructure across the country. Chairperson, an ANC government is making progress in the NARISEC program, that is the National Rural Youth Service Corp program, which is also implemented in the very same province that we are in the Western Cape. I know they can claim more that uh, they can claim it. NARISEC is one of the main goals. Uh, main goal is to recruit and develop rural youth to be paraprofessionals by training them to render much needed services where they live. More than 4,500 youth have completed in various uh, disciplines and in the construction, center, uh, construction sector. A further 855 have been trained 
in records management and are currently involved in scanning and tallying of land claims files in all the provinces. Thus far, a total of 19,000 have, have been absorbed in the program and more jobs have been created, mainly in the construction linked, linked to national infrastructure plan. Amongst others, we saw the trade sector, the government programs, business sector, transport and communication as part of the nine point plan, which was launched by the president of this country. And amongst other projects that we saw, we saw the launch of the HBM factory in Ladysmith with produces latex condoms, the Motmurlot or rail corridor in Pumalanga, which will unlock job opportunities among young people. The expansion of an, an instant coffee production, I'm staying in Pumalanga, you can ask me outside, I will inform you. Expansion of the instant coffee uh, production in KZN, and 17 billion has been invested in more than 5,000 uh, jobs have unlocked in the ocean economy. I, can't, I can tell you that we are active in every part of our country, and we have a footprint in every province. That's the ANC-led government that I'm talking about. Honorable members, empowering youth is building a nation. We agree that a lot still needs to be done, and we have capacity and vigor to create more jobs, uh, job opportunities. South Africa must also start to prepare the youth for the digital and the fourth industrial revolution, the use of ICT tools in all human activities as outlined in the NDP. The NC in its policy document outlined the process in a proper context of creating an environment that will be conducive to the generations to come. The NC also recommends that government must establish a fourth industrial revolution commission in order to make recommendations on immediate, medium and long term priorities and goals for the society as a whole. This forum will engage different sectors of society on the implementation and benefits in the digital development that will surely affect young people. Apart from the fact that young people constitute 50% of South Africa's population, they are indeed a group worth considering when putting together effective business strategies. Despite significant progresses, our country, our country remains divided with opportunities still shaped by the legacy of apartheid, in particular young people and women who are denied the opportunities to lead uh, the lives they desire. Our constitution, which emanates from the Freedom Charter, obliges all of us to tackle these challenge challenges. Chairperson, each generation has a positive responsibility to take affirmative actions to prepare for the ge next generation for a successful economic uh, participation. Chairperson, let me also conclude, because I see I can, I, I'm left with a few minutes. In conclusion, honorable, especially to honorable uh, Kasim no, and Mbata. Unfortunately, honorable DJ member, you did not have a few minutes, you had a few seconds. Your time has expired. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Next speaker is the honorable Chaisa. Thank you very much, honorable chairperson. I take it that the hands that were being clapped was just a sign of welcoming me to the podium. Thank you very much. <laughs> All of the chairperson, June 16, 1976, was a turning point in the South African politics. The contribution made by the then students towards political freedom we are enjoying today will never be forgotten. So it uprising also coincides with the manifestation of odious elements on our shores, which admittedly have stifled the objective priority strategies of inclusive growth and youth development. It is unfortunate that the South African economy is still in the hands of the few. It is for this reason, Honorable Chairperson, that we have to advance the youth economic empowerment. The attention and interest of our youth should be drawn to the fields of agriculture, accountancy, marketing, and, and other skills that will contribute to the youth economic empowerment. On top of the political freedom we gained, economic freedom is urgently required. The economic empowerment of our youth is the best option. Youth should stay away from drugs and other intoxicating substances. We should, as a result, take leave from the 1976 generation whose character and fortitude remind us that our struggle for a just society has just begun. The Agenda 2020 project, which seeks to contemplate the role and contribution of young people in technology, innovation, and trade, must rally young people to self-flagellate on their failures 
and work on their strength. The current irritations in political, however, with their attendant undertones to undermine our sovereignty, will stop at nothing to derail our cause. It is this irritation that should propel us into action. So we must ask, do we simply wither in difficult times? Or like President Tabumbeg has said, wallow in despondency to defeat adversity, we choose neither. Neither is lethal to help annihilate the capture of state and the erosion of values that the Constitution commits us to uphold. NFS, NFS and, and NYTA opportunities should be properly implemented and corrupt individuals should be put aside so that we have got progress in our country. Then we are in a position now to engage on youth development and economic empowerment. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next week is Honorable Pluama. Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Members, first we need to apologize to all the young people who sacrificed their lives for free quality education and yet it's still a pipe dream. And those who are not employed and watching with dismay when those who are in power continue to distribute patronage. Honorable Members, the truth is the youth of our country have been thrown into a guest chamber. Our young people are suffocated when their future fade before their eyes. You only need to be a member of the ANC to be connected with opportunities. You look, you look at the number of graduates who are not working, living under conditions of shame, shameful poverty. The ANC must bow their head in shame. Whether the ANC education, you begin to doubt whether the ANC education policy are not perpetuating PW border reforms. The ANC government betrayed the youth of this country by advocating a liberal paradigm of institutional integra integration and corporatization in 2003. Conscious or con unconsciously entrenched the terms of the apartheid leader. The honorable, honorable members, our young people are banished to a life of inferior and despair. The 23 years of ANC rule can be characterized of years of lost opportunity to create a conducive platform for our young people to reach their potential. Young people deserve a pro productive, fulfilling future. I want to say to young people, don't give up and succumb to challenges. These challenges will make you stronger and better, a better person. There is a hope and light at the end of the channel. Come 2019, the ANC will be out Leaders of merit will act according to the mandate of the government. Don't commit suicide or lose hope when confronted by difficulties, more especially in the rural areas where even when you are not employed, you still require to travel and buy data to search for employment. You cannot afford to live in town since you are not employed. Government must commit seriously to work in hand with the youth. We know you have created a jungle of nepotism and patronage but at least change for the sake of the youth. We, in 2019, when Arang SA and other parties take over from the, for, from the ANC, we'll make, sure that we, we'll make sure that we are not going to misuse young people and indoctrinate them like Hitler did to pounce on perceived enemy to intimidate those who differ with authority of the day. Even institutions which are meant for the youth are used to distribute patronage our young people are bright and creative, creative, but lack opportunity. Honorable members, I'm asking, the, I'm asking for this. These are the solutions that Honorable we are Honorable member, your time forward. has expired. We are saying all young people must Honorable get member, data for free. Your time they must has get expired. free transport to Honorable member, your time has expired. The next speaker is the Honorable Makubele Mashele. Good afternoon, honorable members. Uh, the Aramis Capsel, Lama has just spoken and is such, so disillusioned thinking that he can win elections when he's just the only member in this house. <laughs> members, uh, 
the main economic objective of the ANC-led government since the dawn of democracy has been skills development for job creation, the reduction of poverty and inequality, and the overall sustainable growth of the wealth of the country. Young people are a major human resource for the development, and development of the country and act as key agents for social change and economic expansion and innovation. A significant number of, young, of our young people across the country are not prepared for, for work, thus are unproductive potential workers. It is of principal importance that steps be taken to prevent this waste of our nation's human resource by providing skills and development and training. The theme of Youth Month seeks to mainstream the youth development agenda and participation of young people into the broader economy. The youth, youth economic empowerment is the means through which the youth of the country can be assisted to succeed in life. Youth targeted interventions are needed to enable young South Africans to actively, actively participate and engage in the economy. Many in the opposition benches think that economic empowerment is the function of government only. No, youth empowerment must be a shared responsibility that calls for all partnerships between government, the private sector, and the broader civil society. Giving young people access to skills development programs and jobs remains the priority of government. Our government rec recognizes that the youth of today have completely different struggles, which is high unemployment rate, alcohol, and substance abuse. We understand that the political freedom on its own is not enough. The youth who form the majority of the population are hungry for economic empowerment. The class of 1976 stood for what they believed in, which was better education. They stood up against armed police and brought us the freedom that we are enjoying today. Today's struggles are about the economy and opportunities. We must emulate the youth of 1976 by standing up against all forms of corruptions which erode equal opportunities for young people. We must unite and rise against unemployment and inequality. The agency for the participation of youth at the top end of the economy has been emphasized by the recent unemployment statistics. These unemployment figures paint a disturbing picture, which shows that the country is regressing rather than improving. We welcome the youth set aside budget of about 23 billion for the next five years, tabled by the Minister of Economic Development in his recent budget approved by this house. Increasing investment in young people is the key to their development and empowerment. It is a step in the right direction in the alleviation of poverty. Honorable members, our government continues to invest in the youth of the country. There are many initi initiatives structured and structured programs tailor-made to benefit the youth. To date, over 1.7 million of South Africans have joined the ranks of the middle class. These are young professionals and a well-skilled workforce that is much needed but for our economy to grow. Majority of this population of the middle class strata are the black middle class who benefited from the National Skills Fund. The National Skills Fund is, is the aid scheme of government, which is a vehicle to educate and skill the youth and prepare them to enter the formal labor force and be productive citizens. One of the primary aims of, primary aims of the skills develop, development is to improve access to labor markets in the formal economy, increase income and strengthen social networks for poverty reduction. Learning vocational skills helps to ensure food security, rural development, both in which are important for fighting against poverty and inequalities. To date, about 1.7 million from the National Skills Fund was allocated towards transit to, to train about 1,000 artisans over three years. Training is delivered across the country. About 1.73 million was, given, was taken from the Skills Fund towards ISCOM to train about 1,250 artisans, and about 23 million from the Skills Fund to to towards South African Airways to train about 136 artisans over the period of three years. Honorable members, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. This is by Victor Hugo, who's the, the famous uh, French literature scholar, stated it best when he said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. 
The fourth industrial revolution is that idea, which builds on the digital revolution, presenting new ways in which technology becomes embedded and, embedded and breakthroughs in a number of fields. Our youth has positioned the, our youth has to position themselves to engage proactively with these rapidly evolving technologies. We have within our means the capacity to harness the potential of these technologies, capacity to improve the lives of South Africans. Our government has to ensure that our people, in particular the youth, are not left behind and that technology benefits society as a whole. Training and skilling and long life learning is the only journey to develop the correct and relevant skills for this fourth industrial re revolution. Demand con continues to grow for skills that enable, enable us to keep up with structural changes in the economy brought about by urbanization, technological change, shifting patterns and consumer demand. Honorable members, the question that we must ask ourselves as members of parliament is that how do we measure the impact of youth empowerment programs through our oversight work? Consolidating and integrating youth development into the main, mainstream economic government should be our work when, we, when, budget, when department comes before parliament on their strategy plans and APPs. As young MPs, we should be asking ourselves if these programs are really doing what they're doing on the ground and our oversight work should be towards ensuring that these programs do work for for our young people, instead of coming here and politicking. Various departments come before this house year in and year out and table their, their, their APPs and threat plans. Our eyes must be focused on every government department to ensure that policies and budget talk to youth development. If the youth want to take ownership and leadership of tomorrow, strengthening their capacity and widening their vision is the only choice. There are no shortcuts to development and empowerment. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Albert. Thank you, Chairperson. Many of the debates in this House are experiences of deja vu. A study of the many youth debates conducted since 2009 reveals that they mostly concern the economic status of the youth and an opportunity that would be lost if we do not create an environment for the youth to become employed and propel the economy forward. While the workforce of first world countries are aging, we have available to us a demographic dividend. It is however sad to say that the debates remain the same, the solutions proposed by the opposition remains ignored, and the youth remains lost. But wel verander is die dringendheid van die kwestie, want die jeug raak al gaande meer ongeduldig. Dit verspel niks goed vir sociale cohesie nie. Perhaps a historical approach will be of better assistance to ensure that the matter is better understood. The quagmire of economic stagnation and poor service delivery did not fall out of the sky. It came about due to certain decisions and actions taken by the ANC post-1994. One thing leads to another, also known as causality, and this universal law leads to that phenomenon also known as the chickens coming home to roost. The ANC's first task post-1994 was to replace the mainly experienced public service employees with their own cadres. Those who could not be convinced to take packages were forced, thereby destroying institutional memory and wiping out swaths of experience that could have been used to deliver proper services and importantly, education and mentorship for the new people. It is to be noted that experienced teachers were also forced out of their profession. Since then, the ANC has been treating the youth like mushrooms feeding them a basic education equal to bull-derived manure and keeping them in the dark ages. The ANC is a cadre employing at mense wat meestal die mentaliteit van slaar die moed so neng openbaar in belangrike posities geplaas, namelijk mense oortuig daarvan dat hulle funksie kan verrug waarvoor hulle eindelijk glad nie gereed is of opgeleid is nie. Dit het die effect gehad dat talle arm swart mense endemies blootgestel is aan swak dienstlevering in Zuid-Afrika en die jeug aan stipstandaard onderwijs. Dit is steeds vandag ongelukkig die geval. Daarbij het die ANC ook nog geëxperimenteer met ons jeugd dier uitkomstgebaseerde onderwijs wat talle jong mense ongeletterd geraad, gelaat het. So what is the answer then? How do we save the youth and build a future for them? Given the fact that we have the same debate and ignorance from the ANC year on year, it is clear that we will have to bring merit back into the system by ridding the country of the unmeritorious ANC and its failed policies. I thank you. 
The next speaker is Honourable Boutwa. Honourable members, the ANC has once again exposed its intellectual bankruptcy. They have shown that they do not care about the youth of South Africa. Surely this is not the best that you could do. Your benches are empty because you do not care about the youth of this country. Now, you have also shown that the only young person, by the way, that you care about is Duduzani Mzuma. And how can you begin to even understand the struggles of young people when you are so far removed from them? Now, in fact, the ANC doesn't even have young people. They do not even give them a chance to lead. The ANC benches are like a retirement village. They have got less than 0% MPs, while the DA has, ju has just over 13%. Our members are young, our members are leading, and we are showing it how it's done. Now, Chair, with all due respect... Order, honorable members. Order. Continue, honorable member. Chairperson, with all due respect, the Deputy Minister of Higher Education must be somewhat delusional. He claims that there's more than two million young Order, people... Honourable Members. Continue, Honourable Member. The, he claims that there's more than young people who have entered the missile middle, and I want to understand how, when more than 50% of, of young people who are particularly in NASFAS do not make it past their first year. And these students don't excel because there's no adequate funding, they're not given allowances well in advance, particularly when it comes to their textbooks. Honourable Member, Honourable Member, will you just take your seat? Honourable Members, order. Order. Honour Honourable Members, order. Honourable Minister, order. Honourable Members, while interjections are allowed, you are not allowed to drown out the speaker at the podium. And please, let, let, us, let us also keep track of the debate so that the interjections at least are relevant to what the Honourable Member is saying. Continue, Honourable Member. On, on, a, on a point of order, House Chair. Yes, Honourable Member. Order, Honourable Members. Honourable Members, I want to take the point of order at the back. Does he look old? <laughs> I just want to know that, uh, does he look at an old person when she looks at me? Honourable Member, that's not, <laughs> that's not a point of order. Just uh, continue, Honourable Member. Thank you, Chairperson. He's probably 20 years older than me, so it's possible. Um, Honourable Chairperson, we will once again hear the same recycled jargon from old ANC people masquerading as poster boys for young people like the next speaker. So allow me to bring us back to this debate. And I'm reminded of the words Franz Fanon when he argues that each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, either fulfill it or betray it. Today I stand before you 41 years after a momentous occasion, a day in which the books of history were rewritten, when the youth of South Africa rose up and said, our generation will change the status quo. On the morning of June 16, 1976, thousands of black students came together with one common purpose, to stand up against an unjust government. They understood that we're not fighting a race, nor a man but the unjust system that had suppressed black Africans for decades. A system that refused to give quality education to majority of young people in South Africa. An education system that suppressed free thinking and limited one from pursuing their dreams. Therefore, one cannot ignore the fundamental role the youth played in our liberation and the role that still lies before them. On that day, many young people across the country died. Their death was not in vain. Their legacy lives on, and it shines as a beacon of hope to many of us. If I were to state one of the qualities that I admire about this youth, it's their selflessness, their ability to think beyond your own individualistic concerns. You see, Chairperson, when South Africa held its first democratic election, I was only 14 months old. My mother carried me on her back to cast her first democratic vote. She cast her vote with the hope, you must listen attentively, you must begin to listen. Her hope was that I, as Order her child... Honourable Members. Her hope is that I would have a different life, that I would never be judged by the colour of my skin, but the content of my character, that I would have equal opportunities in a free and a fair society. The only government I've experienced is that of the ANC, and I submit to you, 
we are no longer led by selfless beings. We are no longer led by men and women of integrity. We are no longer led by principles, because if we were, our country would have never been sold for a house in Dubai. We would not be led by those who continue to loot and steal from the poor. We would not have the highest unemployment rate. We would not have more than six million young people that are not in education, employment, or training. Honorable members, there is no true freedom in poverty. There is no true freedom in unemployment. There is no true freedom in sitting at home without an education due to the circumstances of your birth. There is no true freedom when young women are raped and killed on a daily basis. And the minister says that woman who was killed, she was weak. And that's why she's probably howling at me today, because she does not care about women. There is no true freedom when we are scared to walk freely in our own country. There is no true freedom in a junk status or recession. If we are serious about empowering the youth of South Africa, we must begin to understand that education is the path to freedom. The Democratic Alliance believes that an educated and skilled workforce is essential to grow the economy. Education, training, and skills program should aim to unlock the vast potential of young South Africans and the unemployed. We must therefore, honorable members, fix our education system. We must ensure, Deputy Minister, that qualifying students have access to the doors of education and they're given the necessary support for them to excel. The high cost associated with higher education poses a significant barrier to many young South Africans. Our TVET college colleges play a pivotal role in filling the gaps that we need in the South African labor market. We must increase internships and learnerships with the aim of having more professionals in our economy. You see, the present challenges cannot be fixed by the very mentality that created them. We must have job creation and innovation through entrepreneurship. We must create opportunities for people instead of a bloated, corrupt state that is only dragging us backwards. The hands of time have done a complete 360. It is now 5 to the midnight hour of change. The ANC will have a rude awakening in 2019. The youth of South Africa must rise above their political lines, the racial divisions and class, and come together for the sake of our nation and our future children. Honorable members, it is very disturbing to stand here as a young person and I'm asked why am I not at school. I am here to advocate for the fellow South Africans. I'm here to advocate for young people whose struggles I've seen on a daily basis. By the way, I'm still a law student. You must go and read about it. Now, like the youth of 1976, to my fellow South Africans sitting up in the gallery, we must also find our mission. Allow me to suggest that our mission is to eradicate the social injustices that still prevail. Our mission is to create a free and fair society with equal opportunities for all. Order. The next speaker is the Honorable Deputy Minister in the Presidency. Honorable Deputy Minister. Thank you. Order, Honorable Members. Order. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. The regards to Order, the honorable members of the Masibambane High School and also from Hector Peterson High School and uh, Glucom Voss High and the Kailisha College students who are here today waving their beautiful new South African flag and showing their solidarity. <laughs> honorable House Chair, as we commemorate the 14th anniversary of the youth uprising on June 16, we are reminded just how far young people have come over the decades since the fateful day, that fateful day. This debate must make an honest reflection of the strides that we have made as a country to improve the lives of the millions of young people. To suggest that 1976 is no different to 1994 and that 1994 is no different to 2017 is essentially to be blind to the truth that every South African see on a daily basis, that South Africa has dramatically changed compared to 19, I mean 1976, comparing it to 2017. Yes, there are still challenges, and those challenges are, are, what we are hard at work in ensuring 
that we uh, deal with. Contrary to popular belief, and as suggested in many quarters, young people are not lazy or feel entitled. Young people do not want handouts, but rather they want a hand up. They look to us as political leaders of this country to create an enabling environment in which they can succeed. This situation of youth in many ways mirrors the development of our country over the last two decades. The freedom pathway to democracy and development has not been an easy one. It's an, it's an uneven pathway characterized by strides, fits, starts, leapfrogs, and obstacles. Good development progress has been made with our democracy restoring the dignity of millions of South Africans and changing their lives for the better. But we are reminded that more needs to be done as we tackle unemployment, inequality, crime, racism, corruption, and substance abuse that threaten to derail us. We, I mean, while we have made good progress in youth development, we recognize that this is not enough and that more needs to be done and that we must institutionalize youth development. We must build apparatuses for oversight mechanisms, structures, systems, and programs that can stand firmly and advance youth development. The National Youth Policy 2020 is our key instrument for youth development. The National Youth Policy was informed by the African Youth Charter, which suggests that a national youth policy must, cross, must be cross-sectoral in its nature and must enable youth development to be integrated and mainstream into all planning and decision making as well as program development. And effective oversight and monitoring of policy implementation must follow. And thus, the Presidential Working Group on Youth is central in ensuring that we conduct this particular oversight. Now, Honorable Kasim suggests that there's not been progress at all, and in fact, almost is blind to the progress that has been made. But Honorable Kasim is so out of touch, and I want to use this opportunity to congratulate Babes Wodumo and Nasty C, and those young people there know whom we are talking about. Now, you're so out of touch with them. You are so out of touch with them, and I'm certain that uh, DJ Menirie may teach you a thing or two about, on, about uh, Babes Wotumo and Nasty C and Quest and many others. But how can you be so out of touch about the cultural interests of young people and yet come here and claim that you speak to the same young people? It's probably because you are overly indulged with the lyrics of Steve Hoffmeyer, which you come here and repeat on a daily basis. But not only did you say that, uh, you know, both Honorable Botwa and uh, Honorable Mbata reminded me of my engagement with young people in Kailicha, I mean, in uh, Hector Peterson High School, who insisted that we should put history as part of our education system. Now, to suggest here that people such as Solomon Matlangu, who died in 1979 at the, um, at the hands of the apartheid regime, sacrificed his life that Solomon Matlangu spent his time drinking wine and whiskey in exile. He is actually blasphemous to suggest that people like Patrick Chamusa, who was deployed into the country to bomb Sassol and disrupt the apartheid regime and its economy, and that those who trained him were lavishing in exile, is actually blasphemous to suggest that people like Ruth First, who died from a letter bomb, and to come Mr. here Mr. in this Honorable house Deputy and Minister. rubbish that history is Honorable actually Deputy blasphemous. Minister. And you and Honorable Botwa need to be taught history A, B, C. Honorable Deputy Minister, will you just take your seat? Order, Honorable Members. Order, Honorable Members. Why are you rising, Honorable Member? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Is the Deputy Minister willing to take a question? Honorable Deputy no. Minister, are you prepared to take no. a question? No. No. Shame Continue, on Honourable you, Deputy Minister. Shame on you. Shame on you to desecrate on the democracy that has been achieved and that has been established, and to actually rubbish the efforts that have been made by many others in order to ensure that we realise our freedom. Honourable Shengwa comes here and say that there's no multi-party youth forum because the ANC has got only one young person below the age of 35. But he wouldn't tell us 
as to how many young people in the, in the IFP are actually under the age of 35, because he's the only one. But even worse, but even worse, even worse, he came here, Honourable he came Deputy here Minister. looking much older than Honourable Ben Honourable Martin Deputy is there. Honourable Minister, please take your seat. Honourable Schlengwa, why are you rising? I, I, I feel that... He, why are you rising? I don't want to hear what you respond. think. He what? asked me a question, so I must respond. No, no, Honourable Member. Please take your seat. Oh, so I can't respond. Take your seat, Honourable Member. Oh, but there's still one. Continue, Honourable Deputy Minister. Thank you. It is such a pity. It is such a pity that young people such as Honourable Shengwa and Honourable Butwa who come here and parade their age are actually more senile than the oldest people I know, more hard of hearing than some of the people I, older people I know, and actually lose this memory as soon as they are sent to this uh, On a point of order, Chairperson. Order, what's the Honourable Member's point of order? Uh, Chairperson, is it parliamentary for that very old Honourable Member to call other Honourable Members senile? Honourable Member, take your seat. Is, that, is it parliamentary? Take your seat, Honourable Member. Take your seat, Honourable Member. Continue, Honourable Deputy Minister. Let me illustrate their loss of memory, Honourable, uh, Honourable House Chairperson. As part of the, as part of the uh, uh, address by Honourable Manana, he comes here, he opens the debate, 15 minutes later, the, all these honorable members forget, and that's how they lose their memory, listening, and display their senility. Higher education enrollments today stand at close to 900,000. In 1976, there was less than 100 black people or black young people in universities. That in itself represents progress. The number of university students graduating from higher education increased Point by 6% from 180,000 in 2013 to 191,000 in Honorable Deputy 2015. Minister, just take your seat. Honorable. Why are you rising, Honorable Member? I'm rising on correcting the truth. He's no, lying Honorable Member, me. that's not a point of order. University of that's Temple a point for more debate. Than take, take your seat. Students I'm switching off your mic. Continue, Honorable Deputy Minister. Order, Honorable Members. Thank you. Now, now, part of the things that not only are they blind, I mean, not only are they hard of hearing and, and, and all of that, but they are also blind. Because they are blind to the fact that more than 15,000 in the last uh, financial year have been trained as intense and as part of graduate development program. And many of these young people will be integrated into the public sector. 15,000 young people will be trained as part of the Working for Water program. More than 18,000 young people have gone through the NARISAC program, and many of them have changed their lives as a result of that particular program. Of the 1.1 million young people who are participating in the extended public works program, many of those are young people who had given up hope and who now see hope because it gives them an opportunity to change their lives. 48,000 young people in 2016 have graduated as artisans. Now, the old Verkramte apartheid regime did not allow young black South Africans to be trained as artisans. Today, this ANC government is making progress with regards to that. As we speak today, in Gauteng, the, in Gauteng, the premier of Gauteng is launching Tsepo 1 million. Uh, uh, in, in, in Gauteng. Now, more than 350,000 young people already have gone through this project. But what is sad, what is sad is that those who came here, Honorable Butwa, drunk in her ageism, drunk in only seeing people's weaknesses on the basis of their age, but lacks objectivity in terms of what needs to be done for young people. She is blind to the fact that her own DA, in Tswani is cancelling the tap of 500,000. And that's why the ANC government in the province of Gauteng is upscaling this into a million more. So you can come here and be young and expose the fact that you are more reactionary than some of the very progressive old people who are sitting on this house. In fact, I think what is said up, what is said up on the part of Andre Butwa is to think that her party is led by a young black male. 
And I think the events of this history have shown to the contrary. They have shown that in as much as the Honorable Maimani young black man occupies the seat, there is some remote control sitting somewhere. And what happened this week was to stage manage the process to try and induce back the vote which you may have lost. But I want to tell you now, no matter how long the wool is, you will not succeed in pulling it in the eyes of young people because they can see the lies that you are trying to project. They know who's in charge. They know who's in charge. They know that none of you, especially the absentee order, leader of the members. opposition, order. is actually uh, not in charge. Now, part of the Part of the, part of the things with the, which, with the, with the opposition almost always comes here and talk about, and I'm sure you've noticed they've never said anything about it. Order, honourable member. Is their consistent complaint about the National Youth Development Agency, and do you know why? It is because they are very impressed themselves with what the NYDA has been doing for the last three to four years. That's why none of them came here to complain about the NYDA. And part of the progress and success that the NYDA has achieved, achieved includes the training of more than a thousand young people into entrepreneurship and actually inducting them into small businesses. A successful youth built program, which they are doing with the Department of Human Settlement, creating jobs through its limited and mega resources, and also more than 1,500 young people benefiting from the Solomon Matangu scholarship, and more than a million young people having gone through the NYDA scholarship, I mean, a, a career guidance program. And that's why none of them will come here and rubbish the NYDA, because they know young people are watching this debate, and they'll be disappointed with them in terms of saying that the NYDA is working. Yes, I want to say to young people out there, yes, we have listened to you in terms of access to NYDA services. And as part of this uh, next two uh, financial year, the NYDA will be opening two new branches, one in, I mean, uh, one of those being in Tata and the other being in Newcastle, as part of expanding services and ensuring that we give quality service to young people. Now, Honorable Kasim, Babes Wotumo and Mampincha, young people, we we'll keep young people on the dance floor. And we're actually very excited about the prospects of this country. So young people who know what they're talking about created something called Ninomo uh, Na. You have jealousy. So you came here and shouted, the ANC will lose 2019 and yara, yara, yara. Let me tell you now that the electorate will be telling you that Ninomo Na. The ANC has built houses for the majority of our people, and they'll say to you when they go to the ballot, Ni no more na. They'll say to you that we've got people having access to education. We've got so many young people whom this government has listened to who today have been kept into institutions of learning. And when they go to the ballot, they'll say to the opposition parties, Ni no more na. They'll tell you that this here is where all of you belongs and that only the ANC will change this country for the better. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister. Order, Honorable Members. Order, Honorable Members. Order. Thank you. You may take your seats. Take your seats. Order, honourable members. Honourable members, that concludes the debate. Honourable members, before I proceed to the next item, I want to make the following ruling. Order. Honourable members will recall that last week I made a part ruling in terms of points of order that were raised during the debate on the President's budget vote on Wednesday the 31st of May 2017. I now want to deal with the second part of that ruling that was made then. 
The ruling deals with points of order that were raised in response to certain remarks made by the Honorable Pluama and also the Honorable Deputy Minister, and I have dealt with that part, the second part that is the Honorable Deputy Minister. At the time of the remarks being made, I indicated that I would study the ANSAT and revert to the House with considered rulings. And having had the opportunity to look at the contested remarks and the rules of the House, I wish to rule as follows. Various members contended that the Honorable Pluama had, in during the course of his speech, and when referring to the President, contravened Rule 85 and imputed improper motives to the Head of State. Having looked at the transcript, I can, can confirm that the member made various allegations that were indeed prefixed by allegations, but also other type of remarks. He also made the following statement on which a specific point of order was taken. And he said that the president was, and I will quote, handing over our country to dark forces, crooks, close quote. Rule 85 refers to reflection upon members, the president, ministers, deputy ministers who are not members of the assembly. And it states that no member may impute improper motives to any other member or cast personal reflection upon a member's integrity or dignity or verbally abuse a member in another way. Subrule 2 states that a member who wishes to bring any improper or unethical conduct on the part of another member to the attention of the House may do so only by way of a separate substantive motion, comprising a clearly formulated and properly substantiated charge that in the opinion of the Speaker, prima facie warrants consideration by the House. Honorable Pluama, your statement was a clear violation of Rule 85. And I must ask you to withdraw that remark. I withdraw, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable members, we now come to motions without notice. Does any member of the ANC wish to give a motion without notice? The Honorable Chief Whip. House Chair, <coughs> on behalf of the African National Congress, we move without notice that this House notes the exhumation of eight United Democratic Front political prisoners on the 31st of May 2017, who were buried in the Mamelodi Cemetery in Twange. Further notes that the eight United Democrat Democratic Front members were hanged for politically motivated offenses between 1986 and 1989 and were buried in unmarked graves. Acknowledges that the eight United Democrat, Democratic Front members were part of the 140 political prisoners hanged between 1960 and 1989 and buried as paupers in cemeteries around Swane. Further acknowledges that the exhumations form part of the Carlos Exhumation Project launched in 2016 which is aimed at recovering the remains of political prisoners who were hanged prior to the suspension of the death penalty in 1990. Recalls that the tasks to recover the graves of the political prisoners was given to the missing persons task team in the National Prosecuting Authority to conduct the exhumation. Commands the missing persons task team for the sterling work in recovering the remains of the former missing political prisoners, and lastly, urges the missing persons task team to continue in their endeavors to recover all political prisoners and activists buried inhumanly in unmarked mass graves throughout the length and breadth of our country. I so move. Thank you. If there are no objections, I put the motion. No objections are agreed to. The DA. Madam Chairperson, namens the DA stel ik voor dat hierdie huis een kennis neem van die F's afsterwe van Karel Skoeman, bekroonde vertaler, historicus en skryver op 77-jarige ouderdom in Bloemfontein. 
ook kennis neem dat Skoeman aan die hoer jongenskool in die perl matrikuleer, een BA graad aan de Universiteit van die Vrijstaat behaal, aan die rooms katholieke seminarium in Pretoria studeer, toetreed door die orde van die Franciscane in Ierland, maar besluit om niet sy eet as priester af te leen nie, en terugkeer na Bloemfontein, waar hy die hoer diploma in bibliotheekkunde behaal. Verder kennis neem dat hy tijdens een lang loopbaan ook werk als bibliothecaris in Nederland, als verpleer in Schotland en als archivaris van de Zuid-Afrikaanse bibliotheek in Kaapstad. Erkenning gee dat Karel Skoeman bovenal een schrijver was en telkens bekroon is, waaronder drie keer met die Herzogprijs. Eén is al beschrijf als die Shakespeare of die Dostoevsky van Afrikaans. Vertalings van zijn romans het in Duits, Engels, Frans, Nederlands en Russies verskyn. In 1999 ontvang hij die orde van voortreffelijke dienst van oud-president Nelson Mandela. Een speciaal instemming betuig met wat zijn medeschrijver Breiten Breitenbach oor hom sê. Hy het net een tree gegee oor die scheiding na een helderder licht waar skadies niet meer die zijn bevlek nie. Selde, indien ooit, het die land en zijn mensen so tydloos weer galm als een schoeman ze werk. Thank you. Are there objections to the motion? No objection agreed to. Thank you. EFF? Thank you, Chair. I rise on behalf of the e e economic freedom fighters that the house not the biggest settlement building project in the occupied West Bank in 25 years and the cutting of 40% of the electricity supply to the Gaza Strip by the apartheid state of Israel. Note that this forms part of the broader colonial settler project of turning the land of Palestine into Zionist national state. Acknowledge that this colonial settler project has been built on the disposition and expelling of over 7 million Palestinians from their land. Further acknowledge that the illegal settlement building in the West Bank and the cutting off of electricity to the Gaza Strip are acts of aggression and defenseless people. Recognize that the consequences of this action will include hospitals and water treatment facilities without electricity and the creation of more Palestinian refugees. Further note that this is all taking place during the holy month of Ramadan, which is of great importance to many Palestinians. Acknowledge the many similarities in the policies and methods of the old apartheid government and the current Israel government. Further acknowledge the need to isolate the Israel government and support the Palestinian people. Condemn the Israel government for the building of settlements in the West Bank and the cutting of electricity to the Gaza Strip. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? Objection, Madam Chair. Okay. Your objection will be noted. Mm. ANC. Thank you, Chairperson. The A African National Congress moves without notice that the House notes that the United Nations General Assembly in its resolution 66 stroke 127 designated June 15 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day acknowledges that June 15 represents the one day in the year when the whole world voices its opposition to the abuse and suffering inflicted on some of our elder generations. Believes that elder abuse is a global society social issue which affects the health and human rights of millions of elder, older persons around the world and an issue which deserves the attention of the international community. <clears throat> Understands that the maltreatment of the elder generation can lead to serious physical injuries and long-term psychological consequences. Recalls that recent research findings draw specific attention to financial exploitation material abuse of older persons as a common and serious uh, problem and calls upon member states and civil society to strengthen their resolve and redouble their effort to eliminate all forms of violence and abuse against 
older people, I so move. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there objections to the motion? No objections are agreed to. Let me clarify the previous motion of the EFF that was objected to by the ACDP falls away. Uh, IFP. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. On behalf of the IFP, I hereby move without notice that the House notes that on Tuesday, 13 June 2017, the world observed International Albinism Awareness Day. Further notes that albinism is still profoundly misunderstood socially and medically, and that this leads to various forms of stigma and discrimination. Acknowledges that in several cultures around the world, and particularly in many African countries, people with albinism live in constant fear of murder. Further acknowledges that in some countries, people with albinism, children included, are killed and dismembered for ritual purposes with parts of their bodies sold for thousands of dollars by criminal witch doctors. And finally, calls on all relevant arms of government to heed the call by the United Nations to spread awareness and to continue their efforts to protect and preserve the rights of persons with albinism to life, dignity, and security, as well as their right not to be subject to torture and cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. I so move. Thank you. Is there an objection to the motion? No objection agreed to FN NFP. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. On behalf of the National Freedom Party, I move without notice that this House notes that law enforcement authorities in Richards Bay in Wazulu Natal seized heroin worth over 100 million rand on Monday, 12 June 2017. And further notes that the drug bust came after members of the Petrola Crime Intelligence had gathered information about a vehicle which was going to enter the South Africa through the Kosi Bay port of entry from Mozambique with drugs. And finally notes that a 27-year-old man was immediately arrested in possession of heroin. An intensive investigation followed, which led to the hawks to Gauteng, where two foreign nationals, aged 24 and 29 years of age, were arrested and were found with 50,000 rand in cash in their possessions. Wherefore, we call upon this honorable house to congratulate the Richards Bay Organized Crime Unit along with crime intelligence officers in Mpangeni and Pretoria as well as the Hawks on a job well done. And encourage our law enforcement agencies to continue to cooperate, cooperating in their war on drugs with vigor and commitment, I so move. Thank you. Is there, are there any objections to the motion? No objections are agreed to ANC. Thank you, Chairperson. The African National Congress moves without notice that the House notes with sadness the ultimate, the untimely death of yet another SAPC actor, Chabu Kanyile, on Monday, the 12th June 2017, at the age of 48. Further notes that Gupega, who was popularly known as gunman from his role on Izo Izo, was found dead in his Soshanguve home in Tswane remembers that he also appeared in other TV productions, including Zone 14, Zabalaza, and Gold Diggers, which is a clear indicator that he was an entertainer. Recalls that he was a charismatic actor who was talented both in acting and music. Understands that the police are awaiting post-mortem results to confirm the exact cause of his death believes that Gubega's untimely death has robbed the broadcaster in South Africa of great talent and conveys condolences to his wife, family, and friends. I so move. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any objections to the motion? No, no objections are agreed to. UGM? Near me? Oh. I'm I move without my apologies. Not. Continue. I move without notice on behalf of the United Democratic Movement that the House 
notes that two dangerous criminals convicted of serious crimes and who made a daring escape from this very magistrate's court on the 24th in the Eastern Cape have been arrested. Further notes that uh, these two criminals were arrested two weeks after they had escaped from court where they were appearing on additional charges related to motor vehicle theft. Recalls that the two criminals had overpowered a prison guard before fleeing in a correctional services vehicle. Acknowledged that at the time of arrest, the criminals were heavily armed with a nine millimeter pistol and R5 rounds of ammunition, but the law enforcement officers apprehended them. Command the swift action by the law enforcement agencies, in particular the South African police service officers and the correctional services officers, calls for the relevant authorities to increase the security of the courts and close the possibility of criminals escaping when attending court hearings. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objections agreed to. FF plus? Me? DA? Thank you, Chairperson. I hereby move without notice on behalf of the Democratic Alliance that this House notes that the city of Tswane was recently named the most eco-friendly municipality at the 2017 Ecologic Awards. Also notes that the Ecologic Awards identify and award individuals, organizations, and communities that contribute towards creating a greener and more sustainable world. Further notes that the annual award ceremony was established in 2011 by Envirolpedia uh, and has grown from strength to strength, becoming one of Africa's most prestigious events on the eco calendar. Acknowledges that in the municipality category, the award is bestowed on a municipality that has developed solutions using its risk assessment and management expertise, forming strategic partnerships to improve sustainability as well as service delivery in municipal functions. Congratulates the city of Tswane on receiving this award and wishes them well in their continued efforts to create a greener and cleaner metro for all who live in it. And finally, thanks Enviropedia and the organization organizers much. of the 2017 ECO the for the expired. award. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Are there any objections to the motion? No objections, agreed to. EFF? Thank you, House Chair. I rise on behalf of the Economic Freedom Fighters for the House to note that the procurement of important foodstuff by the caterers and eating facilities of Parliament Kitchen. Further note that these important food items include butter from Denmark and chicken from Canada. Acknowledge that this is happening while the poultry industry that is on the brink of the collapse because of the unfair competition. Further acknowledge that because of the important food goods, in this case chicken, tens of thousands of South Africans are unnecessarily losing their jobs, adding to our growing unemployment and poverty. Know that this is not a product like cars, which we do not produce, but food which, with which we are very capable and are currently producing, which, which represent the people of South Africa, some who work in the food production industry, ensure that all food catered and supplied by Parliament is produced in South Africa and su support South African jobs and families. Set an example of consuming proudly South African products, including food. We call on South African Parliament to only contract with companies that procure all food that it caters for in Parliament Kitchen from local producers and suppliers. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objection agreed to. Chairperson? Just clarity, that, that sounded more like a oh. member statement oh. than, a, than a motion. 
um, I, we didn't hear within the presentation of it the typical formulation of it's, a statement. It's a motion a without notice. Thank you. Well, well, then it's very oddly formulated, Chair. ANC. The African National Congress moves without notice that the House knows that South Africa's printer weight fund NICAP delivered another superb performance on Saturday, 10 June 2017 by smashing the national 200 meter record at a meeting in Kingston, Jamaica. Further knows that the versatile speedster who holds the 400 meter world record broke the two year old mark of 19.87 previously held by another South African, Anaso Jobodwan. Understand that Van Nicker was performing at the Racers Grand Prix Jamaica Jamaican sprinters Usain Bolt farewell tour where he raced in his final 100 meter on his home soil. Recalls that Van Nicker finished ahead of Jamaicans Rashid Raya and London, and London 2012 bronze medalist Warren Weir. Remembers that two years ago Van Nicker became the first South African to break through the 22nd barrier in the 200 meter when he blitzed to a time of 19.97 in a B final at a meeting in Lucerne and congratulates Wade van Nicker for raising the flag of South Africa once again. We so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objection. Agreed to. Cope? Near me. ACDP? ANC? The African National Congress moves without notice that the House notes with sadness the death of well-known Cape Town runner Nazim Isaacs, who was killed in a hit and run incident in Claremont, Cape Town, early on Tuesday, 6 June 2017. Understands that the 42-year-old Nizam Isaacs, who was part of the ETEC or running club, was doing his morning run when he was knocked down just after 4 a.m. Further understands that the eyewitnesses assisted the police and the patrolling security services by sharing the number plate of a silver Volkswagen GTI vehicle. Believes that Isaacs was an avid runner with a huge amount of experience and was known for being a dedicated athlete and conveys its condolences to his family, friends, and the Iteco running club. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objections agreed to. AIC? Navarona? Arang, South Africa? Abeko? ANC? The African National Congress moves without notice that the House congratulates Midwest West Vets Football Club for winning the ABSA Premiership title and crowned 2016-2017 champions on Saturday, 27th May 2017. Recalls that this is the first PSL title for the club since its inception in 1996 and their second trophy this season after they have won the MTN 8 earlier this season. Further recalls that this is also coach Gavin Hunt's fourth league championship win. Understand that the Bramfontein Base Club secured South Africa's most prestigious football title after a long, incredible, entertaining, and arguable one of the best season in which football fans witnessed plenty spectacular goals in a long while acknowledges that the previous vest deserved to win the league 2016-2017 as they were forced to be reckoned with, were also, were also consistent in playing brilliant football and conveys warm wishes to the vest following their title victory and wishes them well in the upcoming season. I also, I so move. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objections are agreed to. APC, not here. PAC, DA.
House Chairperson. On behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I move without notice that the House acknowledges the dire circumstances in which students at Technical and Vocational Education and Training, or TVET colleges, who've not been able to secure accommodation during their studies, find themselves. Recognizes that students staying in makeshift lodgings, such as empty college offices, face real threats to their health, safety, and academic careers. Notes with concern the admission by the Minister of Higher Education and Training that his department does not currently know how many beds are available for student co accommodation at TVET colleges. Agrees that such information is crucial to addressing the student housing crisis and urges the government to prioritize the building and maintenance of student accommodation in order to ensure access to a safe learning environment and the educational opportunities offered by TVET colleges. I so move. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objections agreed to ANC. The African National Congress moves without notice that the House welcomes the appointment of Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus from Ethiopia as the first African to lead the World Health Organization on Tuesday, 24th May 2017. Recalls that Mr. Tedros had led a comprehensive reform effort of Ethiopia's health system, creating health centers as well as jobs. Understand that his appointment has been welcomed by international medical bodies, charities, and the US government. Believes that his appointment is in recognition that Africa is rising, and like any other continent, has capable leaders with the ability to successfully lead international institutions. Further believes that Mr. Tedros will perform his task to the best of his ability and will make universal health care his priority. Thanks him for carrying the African continent to the international arena and wish him, wish, wishes him much success in his new position of responsibility. I say, I so move. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any objections to the motion? No objections are agreed to. Uh, that concludes motions without notice. The next item on the order paper is member statements. Does any member of the ANC wish to make a statement? I, I think the, the chairperson, on the point of order. On what point of order are you rising, um, honorable member? Chairperson, member statements are a crucial tool for members of uh, parliament to hold the executive to account. We have the second biggest cabinet in the world. We have one cabinet minister, and thank you very much, Honorable Pandor, for being here. But we have one cabinet minister. Look at the empty benches. It's a disgrace. It's an insult okay. to members of parliament on both sides of the house. On the program, yes, I get you. Thank you very much. May Your I point ask is what action is going to be taken, Chairperson? I can't, I can't respond to well, what action. Well, may I suggest that the presiding officers write you to know, the leader of government business Honorable Walters, and highlight this? I think you know what should be done, please. Which is what? I think you know. Please take your seat. You need to the ministers. It, what you have said is noted. Honorable members, the item on the order paper now is member statements. Okay. Uh, we Chairperson? Through you, House Chair, our, our sincere apologies, House Chair. We, we, we concur with the, with the expression made by Honorable Walters. Mm. Of course, we do have, why do we have one minister? We do have three, in fact, we have two ministers in the House. Uh, we have three, Deputy Ministers, and therefore, indeed, it's a matter that we will follow up on mm -hmm. through the relevant instruments that are here in Parliament. We thank you, uh, House Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, can I start from this side going there? Honorable uh, Skosana. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Ishanga no ekulin doveneva tai ANC. Rakela Pambi, Lingotumba, Amaketo, Abuele Law. Lamaketo, Abanjong, Chaga, fourteen June, twenty seventeen, is all a look. Abandu Vesola, Africa, and we temper, and we tanda. By a segala, Lechanga, no goose, a clean, even a good time. Kunga, Koytumbe, Amaketo, Emawatin, Alandela. What seven, a Pongola, KZN, 
Ward 15, Eastern Cape, M. Ngoma, Ward 45, Epabaton, M. Pumalanga, La PANC, Iputa Puta Corner, EFF, La Maoti, Beranga Passiwayo, Leshanga, no ANC, Stogosa is Chavas, South Africa, Bogusagela, Shanga, no ASC, ANC, and Gaka in Ilache, Izo Guba Nan, Gesicati Soke, Sitogosa, and IEC. Gusinga Tamaketo Gushegangaga, Siratela Pambil in a Kutani, Ikakaramba, Itemba, Les Chava, ANC, Gia Togoza. Thank you very much. Togoza, GA. Thank you, Chairperson. Revelations over the past few weeks of Gupta influence in all spheres of government have raised question marks over the Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs and his connections to this corrupt shadow state. In April last year, Minister Des Van Royen stated categorically that his one day in and out trip to Dubai shortly after his appointment was in his private capacity and that he had paid for it personally. The fact of the matter, as revealed in the Gupta leaks emails, is that the trip was paid for by the influential Gupta family. In parliamentary questions and in the media, the minister has repeatedly denied his association with the Guptas, yet his own chief of staff and special advisor have direct links with them. In fact, shortly after the oh-so-honorable Van Royen's appointment as finance minister, said chief of staff sent an email to Gupta affiliates entitled, Gents, Finally. So the, question we need to ask, the questions we need to ask are these. Why are we being lied to? What do they seek to gain from his appointment? And the answer is right there before us. They want to get their hands on the 440 billion rand that is municipal expenditure annually. Not content with robbing our state-owned enterprises blind, they now seek to loot our municipalities too. Chairperson, how much longer must we put up with useless ministers, corrupt officials, and the shadowy hand of the Saxonwald Mafia? EFF. Thank you very much, I ask Chair. This week, the chairperson of Prasa Board, Mr. Popo Mulife, expressed disgust at the failure of the Hawks to investigate corruption, which happened at Prasa under the chairpersonship of a certain Mr. Sifiso Butelez, who is now the Deputy Minister of Finance. The allegations of corruption against Mr. Butelez while at Prasa are not new. This House will recall that the former public protector advocate Tulisile Madonzala released a report about corruption at Prasa, which was called derailed. In that report, she recommended that Mr. Buteleze and his board must be criminally charged for contravening several sections of PFMAA. In the course of awarding at least 30 contracts, there is valid evidence and proof that the chairperson of Prasa then, Mr. Buteleze, deliberately misled the board about his knowledge or know-how of certain companies that were bidding. A separate investigation by Treasury Chief Procurement Officer also recommended that Mr. Butelez be criminally charged for overlooking and benefiting from unbungled corruption at Prasa. Out of 216 Point contracts... Point of order, Chairperson. Are you rising, Honorable Member? I'm rising on Rule 85.2. The yes. member must substantiate the statement that is making. I'm doing it Thank now. Thank you, Chair. I, in writing. I'm in on writing. the roll. I'm uh, on the roll. I'm on writing. the roll. Wait, on, I'm on the uh, roll. Honorable Mbacha, please don't respond because this is a point of order, please. Honorable yep. member, the, the allegations and all that says you yes. must have a substantive yes. motion. We know that. Continue, Chair, Honorable Mbacha. Oh, Chairperson. Continue. Chairperson. Chairperson. Continue. That point of order is extremely oh. out of order. Con Honorable Mbat have ruled. Please continue. Yeah, thank you very much. Under his chairpersonship and his brother's company was also awarded 150 million shipping and logistic contracts. Now, point Mr. Butelez has Honorable been Honorable member, your time has now expired. Yeah, point thank of you. order. Thank you. Chairperson, oh. I, I don't quite understand your response okay. to the point of order that Yeah, the reason why you are old. 
Chairperson, on, could you ask that honorable member to honorable Mbata, what he has just said? Honorable Mbata, can we please respect one another in the House? To refer to a member of this House just to say yes because you are old is unparliamentary. Can you please withdraw that? Please. She's young at heart. Honorable Mbata, please withdraw. I withdraw. Thank you. Honorable uh, well, Minister. Uh, I thank the Honorable Mbata for withdrawing, but I'm not surprised. And actually, I think that, Chairperson, these uh, insults to uh, senior citizens, whether I am one or not, are really not worthy of a house of our character. So I do think we should look at it. However, I am rising with respect to 85-2, Chairperson. The Honorable Mbata made allegations against a member of this House and has not brought a substantive motion which is properly motivated. A statement as part of the rules is not a substantive motion, mm -hmm. alleging misconduct which must be brought to the attention of the House only by way of a separate substantive motion. Yes, you are and correct. And you should then have ruled the Honorable Mbata out of order and Hon not allowed him to continue. Honorable Member, thank you very much for that. I think I highlighted to Honorable Mbata that it's true. It must be a substantive motion. Thank you. Chairperson. Chairperson. Chairperson, can I address you? Yes. Chairperson, there is no need for a substantive motion on the information that Honorable Mbata read. That information was even presented to SCOPA sometime this year by PRASA, and that information is public knowledge. PRASA, in actual fact, is supposed Thank you to very summon much. all those people to come and I pay think, back the I money of the I state that ruled, they took. I have crooks. ruled on that matter, Honorable Mente. I have ruled and we continue. Thank you. Uh, can we have the ANC? Oh. Yeah. Honorable Phil Tiny, yeah. on, on which rule are you rising? May I address you, Chair, on this matter? No, not on no, this matter. No, oh, I have oh, already no. ruled on it. Please. Oh, oh, on a ruling, Chair. No, we have ruled on that matter. Can I have a yes, member? Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. The African National Congress condemns the rise of African nationalism and neo-Nazi uh, sentiments, which recently surfaced at the University of Stellenbosch. On the 9th of May, 2017, we learned with dismay the blatant overt uh, racism and propagation of white supremacy by a certain sector of student community in an effort to reverse the gains of the former exclusive white Afrikaner University in the Poland region. Posters with Nazi undertones had, to, had been put up on the campus. The posters with a big heading, the anglo Afrikaner student and the slogan, fight for Stellenbosch, was used to advertise a meeting at a university venue organized by an organization called the New Right. The image of the poster is reminiscent of Nazi-era propaganda. The ANC welcomes the university's statement uh, condemning racism, uh, racial superiority, and any attempt to polarize the institution. We understand that in 2016, the institution officially amended its language policy uh, to reflect an inclusive and constitutional approach to education. However, we call upon the university to expose and reject incidents of this nature and apply harsh punish punishments to the perpetrators. The demon of racism has to be uprooted in its totality. I thank you. Thank you, IFP.
Thank you, Honorable House Chair. 23 years into our constitutional democracy, some learners are still being turned away from our public schools on the basis of religious intolerance. It has been brought to our attention that a learner and adherent of the Sikh um, religion was not permitted entry at Dinoni High School because of the fact that long hair and turbans, which are two cardinal tenets of the Sikh religion, are not permitted in terms of the school's code of conduct. Mm. The school principal did not reply to any parliamentary correspondence we sent him in this regard, and we accordingly referred the matter to the Gauteng Provincial Education Department for immediate investigation and possible disciplinary action. To date, this matter remains unresolved, and the learner was forced to find an alternative school so as not to miss the second year. Chairperson, this is a violation of the learner's constitutional rights, not only to education, but to equality, dignity, freedom of religion, and to having his best interest being of paramount importance in every matter concerning his person. This learner has been discriminated against by an apartheid-style high school operation run by Principal J.D. Seronio, and I now feel that the Honorable Minister of Education should get involved in this matter. I thank you. Thank you. UGM. Clapping. ANC. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The ANC sends their condolences to the Logart family on the passing away of Yusuf Logart on Sunday, the 11th of June, 2017. Yusuf was a sports hero and an administrator who promoted non-racial sport when it was not fashionable to do so. He was a giant who advocated that there can be no normal sport in an abnormal society. He will remain one of the sports persons that transform sports in South Africa. Logart stood tall amongst men like Kaya Mojola, George Singh, Norman Middleton, R.K. Naido, Dan Tuala, Rama Reddy, Kasim Basa, Morgan Naidu, Percy Son, Hassan Hawa, Errol Vauda, S.K. Chetty, Frank van der Horst, Colin Clark, Abdullah Abbas, Sam Ramsemi, Krish McAdoo, Bill Jardine, McKenzie Sofafile, Maluleke George, Raymond Urien, Errol Haynes and Danny Jordan, and many others including women leaders in sport. All of them in a league of their own, many of the above has passed away over the years. We pay tribute to all these anti apartheid struggle sports heroes, including Yusuf Logart, who took a difficult journey and sacrificed a lifetime for an equitable, non racial sports dispensation in South Africa. May his soul rest in peace and rise in glory. Thank you. Honorable Member, I think you are aware that you are dealing with, mo with statements now. Thank you. Cope. ANC. Thank Mag you, House Ma Chair. Okay. <laughs> I'll call you by name, guys. <laughs> Thank you, House Chair. The ANC has committed itself to actively combating serious and violent crime by being tougher on criminals and organized syndicates. We therefore commend the swift police response to a tip of a, of a plot to bomb an ATM in Hammersdale, west of Devon on Sunday night, 4 June 2017. This move led to a shootout between the suspects and the police, resulting in nine people, including a police officer, being killed. Police have recovered two rifles, four handguns, five explosive devices, two det detonators, a gas mask, a Google, a pair of gloves, and two cars. The ANC commends the police for standing their ground against an armed group who were prepared to kill law, law enforcement members and had the firepower to do so. We share and mourn with them the loss of the warrant officer. 
The ANC also commends the South African public for working with the police, reporting acts of criminality, especially before they happen. It is only by working together that the ANC-led government believes we can defeat crime. I thank you. Thank you, GA. Thank you, House Chairperson. Chairperson, the release of the mining charter today is proof that the ANC government does not care about long-term and sustainable transformation in the mining sector. <laughs> Version 3 of the, mine, of the mining charter will be a disaster for the mining industry. In presenting its new rules, which amount to a massive giveaway of mine value to the ANC's favoured groups, Minister Zwane has opened the doors to more ANC crony enrichment. The DA supports share schemes for miners when they, where they have structured to benefit the workers and are economically viable. One way of diversifying the mining sector would be to bring mine workers into mining schemes. It's pointless to try and diversify if it leads to the collapse of companies. Almost 450,000 South Africans work directly for the mines. At least as many gain work in associated industries. Chairperson, the future of their jobs are now in doubt. Mr. Zwane and Mr. Zuma's grasping charter will be to blame in the end. I thank you. Thank you, EFF. Thank you, Chair. When the EFF stood here last week and argued that the extension of Security of Tenor Act was just a legal mechanism for evicting people from the land, the ANC laughed at us. The truth of the matter is, of the matter is that eviction of our people from the land is still ongoing. We were horrified and dismayed when we were notified that people residing at Dan Brody Estate between Gekut and, and Ado in the Eastern Cape are being evicted from their land by white farmers. These people have been residing on that piece of land for generations and have been subjected to various forms of evictions through that period. They were not helped to lodge a land claim before 1998 cutoff date and were one of the first group to lodge a claim when the Restitution Amendment Act was passed. Despite this family, the, despite this, they face an uncertain future in the land of their forefathers. When Mr. Nkwindi was still the MEC in the Eastern Cape, this matter was reported to him by Mr. Festile, who leads that community. Mr. Nkwindi failed to provide leadership then, and he's failing to help those people today. We urge the department to engage Mr. Festile and find lasting solutions with the problems in that estate. We condemn the department's prioritization of the needs of white commercial interest over the interest of justice and rapid land restitu restitution. We further condemn the ineptitude of Mr. Quinty, who has Your known about has this expired. matter but have done Thank nothing very, about Thank it. Thank you very much. Your time has expired. ANC Magikan. Thank you, House Chair. The ANC welcomes the milestone achievement by the police and other role players in the fight against rhino poaching, especially in Limpopo in the past two months. The multidisciplinary rhino poaching task team has arrested 50 suspects and recovered 13 rhino horns, two elephants tusks, and 19 hunting rifles during ongoing police operation in various parts of the country over the past two months. The team also recovered 15 silencers, two pistols, one shotgun, and one, 155 rounds and ammunition, amongst various other in terms of in the, in, in the evidential value during the operations. As per standard pros, procedure, the rifles and pistols were sent to the SAPS Forensic Science Laboratory in Pretoria for ballistic testing to determine if they had been used to commit other crimes. The suspects appear in various courts across the three provinces for different charges. On 5 June 2017, the police in Hospray outside Palaburwa in Limpopo arrested three members of a suspected 
suspected cross-border rhino poaching side Thank decades. you very much. To the time has expired. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh -huh. Oh, ANC. Oh, are you there? You disappeared. AMC, yeah, uh, no, Ahang is still there. Thank it you. had disappeared previously. <laughs> Thank you for supporting. Thank you, Honorable Chair. This year cannot be the year of our tambo. This is the year of Brian Mulefe, Claudia Mutsoining, Minister Batavili Damin. We cannot associate these incompetent leaders with OR Tambo. This will be an unforgivable, unforgivable injustice to his legacy and contributions. We have committed a serious transgression to use OR Tambo under this administration where the only currency is betrayal and treachery. With the Guptas and Duzani Zime as the new oligarch, with their get rich quick schemes, OR Tambo cannot be associated with these fiefdoms. The Zuma administration has put our economy on its knees. The bottom line is our country is sold. Those who are supposed to be the guardian of our constitution and country are running faster than Castas Minya to Dubai. I want to urge all South Africans to come together and fight this virus called corruption. Our public life is poisoned by greed and dishonesty. We have lost confidence and trust to the ANC. We have lost it. We must take over our country in 2019 when we kick out the ANC. ANC decides, no, wait. Yes, ma'am. Person, thank you, Chairperson. The African National Congress believes that the, gra the graduation of 776 new foundation face uh, teachers who recently received teaching degree from the SENS private higher education institution will go a long way in terms of improving quality of schooling in rural areas. Most of these graduates were previously employed, unemployed youth from the rural areas of the uh, KwaZulu-Natal and were beneficiaries of the, of the bursaries from the provincial Department of Education. They were originally targeted for their desire to remain in their communities after completing their studies. The department and sense recognize that the cost of enrolling uh, in the university away from home doubled for students from rural areas. Therefore, after registration, uh, uh, registration students were trained at nine student support centers across KZN. Learners in rural areas now have a chance for a better education in their own home language from teachers. Thank you very much. Who are from the time has expired. Thank you. I thank you. GA. Thank you, Honorable Chair. From Kobodi, Ward 15, a rural community in Nkomazi municipality still has no running water after being promised water just before the 2011 elections. Six years of promises are what keeps residents awake at night as they know that tomorrow one of them would have to walk one or one and a half kilometers to go and fetch water from a stream that the entire community has to share. Yes, there is water delivered, but not by the municipality. They are delivered by water entrepreneurs who charge 30 rand for their services. To add aggravation to the situation, and Komazi municipality has a high court interdict against them, and the sheriff of the court has already impounded 30 of the municipality's vehicles due to a complex web of non-payments to service, to pro uh, service providers. The DA is particularly worried about this, as these vehicles are contributors to an already strained service delivery in the municipality. This will not happen if Nkomazi was a DA-led municipality, as we are synonymous with clean audits and effective service delivery. Who is jealous now? Residents of Nkoboti have been waiting 23 years for the ANC and still nothing has come. Minister Mokonyani, when are you ever going to intervene? Thank you, ANC. Tatani Mabasa. Chairperson, littering and dumping 
cause diseases to communities, especially to the poor. Littering is wrong and costly to the government and society. It strips a residential area and a business area of dignity. It is incorrect of any community member to dump rubbish at places where that rubbish invites rats, illnesses, and pollution of water. This practice of littering robs children of a safe playing environment. It is wrong of any vehicle driver to throw a bottle out of a moving car, disregarding the safety of other drivers and pedestrians. The value of houses can dramatically reduce because of people who are tampering with beautiful natural vegetation through littering. This dirty practice is also done by industries that dispose of acids and other dangerous chemicals into streams of water. ANC urges all South Africans to love themselves and to love their country by stopping littering. We call upon community leaders to, co to promote campaigns, educating and creating awareness among residents and businesses that the act of littering is dangerous and harmful. Nakensa Manana. Nakensa. Uh, that concludes member statements. Are there any ministerial? What is it, Honorable Filtan? You are on your feet? I did, and there was no response. UDM, I called it, and the, you didn't come up. You were not there. No, then you didn't respond. I did, I know. These are my, can, we can check even the handset next time. Thank you. I'm not going, do you want me to allow you? Okay, let me be, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The 1st of June is an International Day of Protection of Children. And as this house will mark this day, while we were at the same time acknowledging the Youth Month. Little did we know that in the Eastern Cape, the child welfare non-profit organizations are closing down due to lack of sufficient suffi financial support from the Provincial Department of Social Development. On Monday, the 12th of June, 2017, the Child Welfare East London ceased operations due to drastic state budget cuts. The Eastern Cape Social Development Department cut its annual budget from 2.2 million in the last financial year to 235,000 rands only from April this year. More than 900 abused children under the care of this organization will no longer get support. Hundreds of families who used to receive res relief from physical abuse as well as psychological support from the center will now be turned away as it battles to manage its new financial position. This seems to be a trend in the Eastern Cape as the Nelson Mandela based society has already received communication to the effect that its funds will also be cut by the same department. I hope that this is not another SDMNI tragedy in the making. With a different form. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes member statements. Are there any ministerial responses? Uh, Minister Pando, Deputy Minister Oliphant will be the second one. Deputy Minister Chohan. Yes, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, once more in response to a number of the statements, I wish to reiterate that the provision of 85.2 provides honorable members with the opportunity to substantively deal with corruption, as we must. And we should then submit substantive motions properly motivated so that all these allegations are investigated. The rules allow that that should be done. The rules permit that that can be done. Chairperson, we welcome the 
victory by the African National Congress in five wards in different parts of the country. This is merely part of the march to 2019 where the ANC will win decisively the national elections. We will continue to work hard as is illustrated by the delivery of housing, the provision of education, and the improvement of facilities for sports throughout the country. We agree with those honorable members who say we must reject racism and any association with fascist conduct or belief in our schools as well as in our tertiary institutions. And we would urge all members to ensure that all our educational institutions hold up the highest regard for the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Minister Oliphant. Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. I, we also welcome the statement by the DA on the Mining Charter. However, it must be noted that the Mining Charter is the transformation agenda of the country in the mining industry. And what we need here is a cooperation, a cooperation between the Department of Mineral Resources, especially with the Chamber of Mines and other stakeholders. We do agree that in this transformation agenda, the broad-based nature of it must include the workers, the communities, and also the entrepreneurs in general. We do agree also that we could handle this matter better. That means that uh, the leadership within the mining industry and within our government must come together to look into this matter so that we can deal with it and have some engagement to find some solutions. But to try and shoot it as an anti-transformation stand will not help because in the mining industry, that's where we need this transformation. And the tool that is agreed upon in terms of the law of the country, the MPRDA, is the mining charter. So the process, the content must be handled better going forward and this message is taken in that order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Deputy Minister Chohan. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, certainly racism, whether it be at our universities, our schools, or on the farms, cannot be tolerated in this day and age. And I wonder if these tendencies in our society is not reflected in some of the actions of our political leaders and very often our actions and statements in this very parliament. Our social compact in 1994, our constitution, which everybody claims to support, must be upheld at all costs. And very, very often we find political leaders saying things and doing things that are overtly racist. And perhaps in this matter, we should all re begin to reflect and start by asking all political parties to expel members of their party who show themselves in favor of racism and colonialism. The honorable member of the DA uh, claims that the DA is synonymous with good governance. Is it good governance, Chairperson, to earmark prime agricultural land in Cape Town, which is very scarce for housing when there are so many other options? Is it good governance, Chairperson, to destroy people's shacks when, the, when it is stormy and cold on a winter's morning, as has been done just last week in Masi, in the Cape Metro. Is it good governance, Chairperson, to continue employing a convicted fraudster and money launderer and paying them about 100,000 Rand per month, as is being done in the DA-led Mossel Bay municipality? I think not. The DA is synonymous Thank with you. disaster. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you very much. That concludes ministerial statements. The last item on the order paper.
is notices of motion. A and C. Can I start with you, Mamela? Thank you, Chair. I move on behalf of the ANC that in its next sitting that the House debate investment in electricity, rail, water and transportation infrastructure as key to the country's transformation. I so move. Thank you. GA? I hereby move on behalf of the Democratic Alliance that at its next sitting, this House debates how indigenous knowledge systems can contribute to food security and climate change adaptation and mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, EFF. EFF or Osayan? Iti Boglande la ulendrum, a gay kulum and got daba, Raga Prasa, Jango Bax Kunen King and Jay. Yabantu Enga Yabantu Octon Gutwaza Bakisha Bapele Msebenzi Genga Yalin Yalin Kampa Nenga was Gwenzu Msebenzu Ab. Kanja Alo Futi Kulum and Angota Bala Mategis. Jong Oba Kunen King Abaza Bangenem Kwa Konutu Kulum and Agangen Lele Ala Lele I I Kalo Zabantu Ngoba Iskate Sikso na Manje Speli Liskato Guti Koto Abantu Uti in King Abapegene Nazo. Jobe Tinen, Tinasak Nes Telega, Sexus were native, native Mela, Stellung Gong or Shaga Transport, Agan Sumer Luta Banyabong. Sabonga, ANC at the back, yes? No. Wait. Thank you, Chairperson. I move on behalf of ANC that in its next sitting, the House debates promoting good governance, democracy, human rights, justice and the rule of law on the African continent. I thank you. Thank you, IFP. On behalf of the Inkacha Freedom Party, I shall move in the seat of this house that the house debates noting the periodic taxi strikes which have caused major delays in the Gauteng and Guazulu Natal, leaving thousands of commuters, including school children, stranded and the negative impact that this has on the economy in Togoza Kulistra. Togoza NFP. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, House Chair. I move on behalf of Bang Pazami Somkule, Tulan. I move on behalf of the NFP that this uh, House in the next sitting deliberates on the need for national dialogue to foster co cohesive racial unity in our society, which is increasingly becoming polarized along racial divisions. <laughs> I so move. Thank Salo, you. on a point of order, uh, Honorable Shbu here, if he wants to make uh, AMA allegations, he must use uh, section uh, rule 85, not this allegation he's making about me. I'm so angry, Mina. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so angry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just so angry. Let's go. Lab. I'm just touching a point of order. I'm just touching. Yeah. Can you please press the button, ma? Thank you. Oh, thank you. I move on behalf of the African National Congress that in its next sitting, the House debates transformation of ownership and broad-based empowerment in the tourist se sector to ensure that the black South Africans secure increased uh, opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. UDM. I hereby move on behalf of the UDM that the House in its next sitting debate the funding model for the ocean economy in the context of the great need to expand our economy and to create more employment opportunities, in particular for the youth. I so move. Siabonga, FF plus GA. Siabonga, 
I move on behalf of the Democratic Alliance that at its next sitting, this House debates the South African Police Service's commitments to addressing high levels of violence against women and children when only one in every six police stations is covered by a family violence, child protection, and sexual offense units. I so move. Thank you, House Chair. While various parts of South Africa have been experiencing droughts over the last two years, leading to restrictions on already limited supply of water, golf courses continue to remain green and waste our limited water supply. Rent Water estimated that there are around 500 golf courses in South Africa, which use on average between 1.2 to 3 million megaliters of water per day. This illustrates how little has changed since apartheid with municipalities throughout the country telling people to decrease their water consumption for essential like showering, cooking, and washing, while the golf courses remain green. We therefore call on this House to debate the water. We therefore call on the House to debate the waste of valuable water by golf courses. Thank you. Thank you. ANC. Nza susumeta. Iku yimela ANC le shaku. Eka ntamo lo ulandelaka. Uwo yi jega jegi sana. Ikuri. But don't you see iti pupu. Tan shuvuki so wati iku rungwana na rungwana. Na so naba fanele kutekerwa enflo kweni. Tani ilo kuba umesa. Ti scientisti. Matokotela. Ti piloti. Ti nese. Nama teacher ya ngwana. Na kensa. ACDP, ANC, here. Thank you, Chairperson. Continue there. <laughs> Thank you. I move on behalf of the ANC, then in its next sitting, the House debates transport infrastructure as an important determinant of economic growth, job creation, and poverty reduction. Thank you. Thank you. I A I C. Babun Chaisa. Oh. Uh, I hereby move on behalf of the African Independent Congress that this house in its next sitting debates the proper plans and measures on how to protect learners and teachers at our schools so as to make schools conducive for proper and safe teaching and learning. I so move. South Africa. ANC. Yes. I move on behalf of the ANC that in its next sitting, the House debates promoting and strengthening technical schools as centers of excellence, focusing on specific discipline and skill sets. I so move. Togoze, APC, PAC, DA. Thank you, Chairperson. I hereby move on behalf of the Democratic Alliance that at its next sitting, this House debates the shockingly high youth unemployment rate of 38.6%. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. ANC. <laughs> they are all done. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes notices of motion and the business of the day. Enjoy your youth day. House is adjourned. It's for us young ones. <laughs>